All right, why don't we go ahead and call the San Bruno City Council meeting of August 25th, 2020 at seven o'clock to order. And if you would be so kind as to take roll. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Mason? Hello. Council Member Medina? Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar? Here. Mayor Medina? Here. Thank you. Uh, and now if we can switch uh, to um, the Pledge of Allegiance, please, if we all could uh, rise and join the council uh, within the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic, with the stand, one nation, under God. Indivisible. Indivisible. Justice for all. Justice for all. <laughs> <laughs> you have to rehearse that again, guys. Yeah, I was going to say, I think our last go around, we, we did better. Um, all right, item three, public comments on items not on the agenda. Individuals are, will be allowed three minutes. It is the council's policy to refer matters raised in this forum to staff for investigation and or action where appropriate. The Brown Act prohibits Council from discussing or acting upon any matter agendized pursuant to state law. And I currently see no hands raised. Okay, I am not seeing. I, okay, so I one, do see one. Okay, one moment. And if there's anybody else that wishes, uh, if you could please uh, raise your virtual hand and so we can uh, begin. Um, um, City Clerk, when you're ready. Stephen Seymour. Hi, it's Sandra Perez Vargas. Hi, Sandra. Hi, good evening, everyone. I want to thank our first responders uh, for all the work they've been doing, all the fires happening around us, the dangers they put themselves in. And I especially want to thank them for helping remove so many animals from those wildfires and helping protect them. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, please. One moment. Next is Tim O'Brien. Tim, I'm trying to unmute you. Hi, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. whenever you're ready. Okay, good, good evening, everyone. Um, just want to say thank you to uh, the city for um, the progress on the park, especially uh, Linda Mason. Uh, for pushing this, uh, at least getting something out there, some grass, so people can, uh, you know, have a great experience in the space uh, and bring a better uh, looking area to the neighborhood. Um, I really appreciate um, your hard work on that, Linda, and uh, Javon as well. Um, it's a great thing to see progress in the city and, um, and and projects getting done and uh, just cleaning up the area is, is a great thing. Um, and just to, also, we'd like to talk about, um, I think it's on the agenda, but but uh, we got to help the, the businesses on the downtown, especially the restaurants that are struggling with some outside dining, possibly blocking off the street, uh, you know, one or two nights in the weekend. Um, it seems to be working for other cities. And it's a great experience for the community and uh, visitors have uh, also come to our city. So I'd like to see that happen um, and be highly considered. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you, Tim, you as well. And next is Charisma Schwartzberg. Hi. Hi, Hi. Whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, city Clerk, um, I wanted to say, uh, first of all, thank you to um, Linda Mason for the email you sent uh, a group of us um, appealing a, a tower from Ryzen um, that's being planned in the San Bruno neighborhood. I also wanted to thank an email from um, Rico Medina and a phone call from Michael Salazar. Um, I wanted to just bring to your attention, um, council members, that I am concerned that some of the resolutions that the city 
has approved in 2009, I believe, resolution 2019, um, are not being adhered to um, during the appeal for the CB CBR. And so I wanted to see if after every appeal, if there's any checks um, done by the city council to make sure that those um, resolutions are being um, adhered to. Um, for example, um, some of these poles, you know, are in wooded uh, residential areas. And I believe, you know, it has to mimic the background. It's what's being listed in the resolutions. Uh, I think more design um, uh, changes might probably be needed on that. Um, and I also wanted to um, bring to your attention that um, it seems like, you know, the appeals process was being rushed. And I understand that in the ordinance, um, only the uh, the city manager is able to approve, um, you know, the final appeal. Um, if there's, you know, any way that, you know, the city council can maybe have a check on and balance on that, because we want to make sure, you know, as we um, have these, you know, telecommunication companies go into our city, you know, that they don't, um, you know, kind of destroy the, the appearance and the beauty of, of San Bruno. And so I just wanted to make to to bring that up. And I wanted to thank you for um, letting me speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schwartzberg, and thank you for being here and uh, sharing your, your views and comments. Thank you. Is there, I've not seen anybody else in the queue at this time. No, I do see one call-in listener, and for that person, um, I just want to clarify, you can press star nine if you have a comment to make. But I do not see any other hands raised. Okay. All right, then we'll move on to item number four. Announcements and presentations. First one is item A, respond before the knock. As of August 11, 2020, the U.S. Census Bureau workers began in-person outreach to homes that have not completed the 2020 census form. Make sure, make sure you and your family are counted by responding to the census. The census only comes around every 10 years and it ensures that San Bruno will receive our share of federal funds for parks, schools, and other programs. You can visit my20census.gov to submit your account. With that, um, we're going to move on to item B, and that is the August wildfire update, and that's the CZU lightning uh, complex fire that we had. I'm going to turn it over to Javon, and then once he's done, he can uh, call in uh, our chiefs. Uh, but also from there, we're going to go into uh, update on the Crestmore Canyon wildfire mitigation project, since it's with the fire department. And then we can ask questions of either of those items uh, after that. So with that, uh, city manager. Thank you, uh, mayor, members of the council, and members of the public, Javon Brogan, city manager. Uh, just want to introduce uh, the speakers that we're going to have on our two uh, fire-related announcements. Uh, as the mayor said, we have two. We're going to have an update on the August wildfire, uh, in particular, the CZU lightning complex fire occurring in southern San Mateo County, as well as northern uh, Santa Cruz County. That update will be provided by uh, our fire chief, Ari DeLay. Uh, we will then uh, roll immediately into an update on our own Crestmore Canyon wildfire mitigation uh, project, and that will be done by our fire marshal, Gabe Slice. Uh, Ari will also provide an update uh, of, um, of how our fire crews are doing. We do have uh, a engine uh, that is supporting the CZU complex fire uh, as a part of a countywide uh, strike team. Uh, but before Ari begins, I just want to note that there are a number of heroes that uh, are providing uh, remarkable service uh, to uh, not just uh, our county in Santa Cruz County, but all across the California. Um, but in particular, uh, I, I just want to take a moment uh, to let the public know and to thank Ari DeLay, our fire chief, uh, for his efforts uh, the night of August 15th, uh, going into the morning of Sunday, August 16th, as he personally hiked three miles uh, into La Honda uh, with the crew to um, 
control the wildfire that was happening in that area, which is, uh, as we all know, Southern San Mateo County. Uh, and, and the efforts of that team that he led, uh, protecting that community is also protecting this community. And so thank you. Uh, it's not often that you have a, a chief <laughs> that is a working chief uh, that, that goes out and, and will hike in uh, miles to um, uh, put out a fire uh, or, or surround it and help to contain it without water, literally just doing it with uh, the, the, the hand tools that they were able to carry in with them. So remarkable effort um, uh, for that community. And thank you. Thank you, Ari. So with that, Ari, uh, will you provide uh, the update? Sure. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the Council, Ari Delay, your Fire Chief. Um, this evening, I'm here to give you a situation report on the status of fires throughout California. And what I would like to do is start off at a statewide level, bring it down to a county level, and then work towards bringing it down to a local level for things that directly affect us here in San Bruno. Um, and before I get started, I'd like to just uh, give you a little bit of uh, terminology. So when we say uh, these complexes, I just want to give you some context so you have a, a, an understanding of what a complex means and how, it, how that name kind of comes about. So a complex is two or more distinct incidents in the same general area that by management action are managed under a single incident commander or unified command in order to find efficiency and simplify the incident management process. So when we talk about these lightning series that go through a large geographic area, uh, if we try to manage it with individual incident commanders, it would be very difficult. So we try to coordinate our efforts and manage them under one incident management system. With that said, um, starting off at a statewide level, uh, statewide, there's four major incidents going throughout California. There are many more, but these are the major incidents I'd like to highlight. Um, and I'd like to also uh, note that the, the resources throughout California are stretched extremely thin lately with all the major incidents going on. And I'm going to go over just quick, briefly these four major incidents. The first one would be the LNU Lightning Complex in Napa County. It's about 352,000 acres, and it's currently at 29% containment. Uh, they had uh, 937 structures destroyed, and they have, currently have evacuations in place, and they have what they call the IMT or an incident management team assigned to that incident. The next one is the CZU August Lightning. This is one particularly obviously uh, important to us here in the city of San Bruno. Um, that fire is currently at 78,000 acres and it's 17% contained. Um, uh, significant progress made on that fire in the last day or two. Uh, the weather has really been helpful and they've been able to get quite a few more resources out to be able to help on the fire line. They have the Butte Complex. It's another lightning complex, just like I described before. It's at about 53,000 acres, and it's at 15% containment. So those are the four major incidents going on throughout California. And then I will just give you a brief update on the CCU complex itself. Again, I said it's 78,000 acres, including both San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. And again, it's at 17% containment. Um, the, the fire only grew about uh, 870 acres yesterday due to good weather and excellent firefighting conditions. They've dropped more than 200,000 gallons of fire retardant on the fire. And the fire is split obviously between San Mateo and Santa Cruz County, and about 12,000 acres of that is in San Mateo County, and the remainder is in Santa Cruz County. In San Mateo County, we lost 11 structures in the south end of San Mateo County. Um, and they're continuing to survey and do what they call damage assessment to determine how many structures have been lost uh, throughout San Mateo and Santa Cruz County. Um, the Sheriff's Office is very engaged and they have mutual aid support, in, including multiple law enforcement agencies across both counties and other counties throughout the Bay Area. And um, I would just say um, one important note, uh, someone mentioned earlier, a member of the public, about large animals. Uh, they had a total of 1,409 98 large animals that were evacuated from residents throughout the south uh, of San Mateo County. And they have an evacuation center that we normally think about for people, but this evacuation center is actually for animals and that's staged at the Cow Palace um, there in Daly City. So um, that is the CZU lightning complex. Uh, we do have, uh, as the city manager noted, uh, Engine 51 is participating in the California Mutual Aid System and is there at the CZU Lightning Complex and is there protecting currently the town of Boulder Creek. Um, I have a good friend that works there and he sent me a picture of our crews actually working in downtown Boulder Creek and thanked us for the response. 
Um, bring it really close home locally here to San Bruno. We just recently, I'm sure everyone's aware, we had a few uh, fires along the 280 corridor. The most significant, I would say, would be the Larkspur incident. This was a fast moving wildfire that was on Highway 280, uh, just south of San Bruno Avenue. Um, this fire was in some heavy fuels and it was upslope and it went to a third alarm. And I would just bring to the council's attention and the members of the public that, you know, right now it's something that's, it's, it's not very common for the city of San Bruno, but smoke is in the air. And that means that fire danger is high. And I would just bring it to everyone's attention that we really need to remain vigilant as a community and uh, make sure that if we see something to say something, if you're not sure if something's right or not, or there's smoke that looks out of place, to make sure and use the 911 system and call and get a response uh, started that way. We would much rather go and respond to a false alarm than uh, take extra minutes of time where we could have been in an emergency that someone's just not sure of. So um, I would just take warning uh, in regards to that. Okay. All right, moving along. Uh, Crestmore uh, Canyon wildfire mitigation. Um, Crestmore Canyon is something that's been going on for quite some time in regards to the pg e pipeline explosion and some of the dollars that came back from pg e um, And we wanted to tell, help tell the story of Crestmore Canyon and some of the work that's being done in Crestmore Canyon. And what we've done is created what we call a story map. And that story map is gonna highlight some of the work that's being done in the canyon uh, to our council and our citizens, and also be able to show some of the progress that we've made. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and queue up this story map. And after that, I'd like to introduce our fire marshal, and he's going to go do another brief overview of some of the progress uh, for the Crestmore Canyon work as well. So, Melissa, if I can go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right. Can everybody hear me? All right. I'm going to go ahead and play the story map. And, and Chief, you are having an echo. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I'm Fire Chief Ari DeLay, and welcome to the Crestmore Canyon story map. We wanted to offer our residents an opportunity to have an inside look at Crestmore Canyon and the ongoing wildfire mitigation efforts. Crestmore Canyon is a large open space area totaling 76 acres and is owned by the city of San Bruno. The canyon is wooded, containing some native species of Monterey pine and California live oak, as well as non-native eucalyptus trees. It is surrounded by the Crestmore and Rollingwood residential subdivisions. This unique open space area provides a rare opportunity to connect people to nature. During the 2010 PG&E gas pipeline explosion in the Crestmore neighborhood, the fire spread into Crestmore Canyon. Fortunately, the devastation was mitigated by the quick thinking and heroic efforts of the first responders. This prevented the fire from spreading further into adjacent neighborhoods. Had a significant portion of the canyon caught fire, large swaths of the city could have been destroyed, with many more people injured or killed. Fire danger in the canyon remains a critical concern of the city and residents of the affected Crestmore neighborhood. This story map of Crestmore Canyon will provide a detailed history multimedia, and ongoing updates of wildfire mitigation work. We hope you find value in this story map and encourage you to explore its contents. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? So that's our story. Story map, and I would like to uh, show you now uh, a quick video that was developed by uh, our PIO team, including assistance to the city manager, Jennifer Dianos, uh, Officer John Hampton from San Bruno Police Department, and members of the fire department, including our fire marshal. Um, and this video is really meant to highlight the work of the three C's uh, that they do every day and their specific work here in the city of San Bruno.
My name is Cesar Ramirez. My name is Jahaira Zaragoza. Daniel. Uh, my last name is Elvarez. John Dorvit. I work for the California Conservation Corps. I'm a supervisor for the California Conservation Corps. I've been doing it now 14 years. I've been with the CCC for uh, a month and a half. Two years with the CCC. About, about 10 years now, a little over 10 years. So it's been a while. Today is, in fact, my last day. We got asked to come out to the beautiful city of San Bruno to do some fuel reduction. And it was an exciting eight days. We've had these devastating wildfires throughout California. It's, it's time to you know, at least try and get them under control. The mountains are pretty steep compared to the hills. The work here is definitely harder than I expected. The hill out there was was awesome, actually. It's, it's been a little while since we've had a, a real challenge at work. I have poison oak everywhere. <laughs> It's exhausting, you know, but you just have to mentally get through it. And I think that my, the best advice that I can give someone is your mind is the one who says no. You know, it's not your body. So you need to push through it. I enjoy finding that person that really wants to be taken out of their element, taken out of their hometown, and, and really try something different, really disappear, really push themselves, uh, really try to find themselves. It, it means a lot to me to be able to mentor these um, these core members, I just kind of steer them in the right direction and help them along with their, their starting their careers. Coming out here, finishing my uh, time with the seas, um, having the hill, having the hike, running a crew, running a chainsaw, um, dropping all these trees, it was just, I couldn't ask for a better ending. And we hope that we've done a, a good enough job or a great job that you'll be asking us back and, and continue to do this kind of work here. That's definitely needed if you look around. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So what I'd like to just bring your attention to is uh, a, a quick map of our progress in the canyon. Um, this is going to be a, a live and interactive a map that's kind of organic and that kind of moves along with our progress throughout the canyon. And it highlights this first what we call a spike. There's an eight-day tour uh, that the three seas do in the canyon um, here in Crestmore Canyon. So if you see, we uh, worked uh, very extensively uh, around the Quail Point um, condo complex, um, and we've done extensive work there, and it's been really a fantastic effort. And before I leave uh, and introduce our fire marshal Gates Slice, I just want to say, thank really uh, our PIO team, uh, Assistant City Manager Jennifer Dianos and John Hampton for their amazing work uh, creating this story map and uh, the work that they have done there. With that said, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Chief Slice, our fire marshal. Can you ever hear me all right? You're good. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the council. My name is Gage Slice, and I am your fire marshal for the city of San Bruno. I'm here this evening to give you a brief update on the wildfire mitigation project in Crestport Canyon. The first segment of the work has been completed, as Chief DeLay had mentioned. So approximately four acres were improved. Uh, the next scheduled segments are September 9th to the 16th and September 23rd to the 30th. The work scheduled for August 26th was delayed because of the devastating wildfires occurring in our state right now. A total of five or six segments are still expected to be completed by the end of 2020. The city has received approval from Judge Elsa on the funds required to finish this phase of the project. Our partners, the California Conservation Corps, will continue to work with the fire department to provide fuel reduction in the canyon. Crews will continue to work with the chipper and put material on the ground to help prevent erosion and to help with weed management. 
The work occurring in the canyon still focuses on the creation of defensible space between the residential neighborhoods and the open space. This project is even more important now. What we have seen these past few weeks can happen so close to home. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Mayor, that concludes our uh, two announcements on those items. Uh, and we're uh, open for any questions or uh, next items on the agenda. Uh, questions, Council Member Medina. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I've been through the canyon a little bit. Uh, it looks much better. Um, if we could possibly have those schedules uh, maintained on the website. I occasionally uh, see a social media post um, asking what's going on, what's next. And um, the primary contact would uh, would be our fire marshal if somebody had a question about uh, Crestmore Canyon mitigation. Yes, and so uh, that story map uh, will be up on our website. Uh, as we mentioned, it will be interactive, so you can follow the, the progress uh, and, and a schedule for when all of the work will be completed uh, will also be up. And again, it's intended to be a living and breathing document. And so as additional components of our larger $3 million Crestmore Canyon wildfire mitigation projects occurs, we will uh, further develop the story map. Excellent. Thank you very much. Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor Medina. Um, so with a sort of moving target and, and we're coming upon fire season, you'd think we were past that by now, but I, I can imagine that these dates are not gonna be really book solid because they're gonna change different things. So how do we get the residents in the neighborhood to really point to the website, right? Not everybody realizes they can go or how to find on the website. So is there like one piece of communication that you can send out that says, fall, that's weird anybody hear that noise yes um okay is there something that they could either call city hall to ask for an update if they don't if they're not connected to a computer because they're not connected to a computer and or the letter would just basically uh, hold on um council members if we could be muted and allow uh, mason and then council member davis will go back to you um uh, regarding the website information. Thank you. So just getting the letter out one letter, so we're not constantly emailing or sending out letters multiple times. One letter, here's the information, whether it's a card, not a letter, just something simple to make sure people know. And I think that's the important piece. Sure. Uh, so uh, Council Member Davis, uh, we are doing both door hangers uh, and a trifold mailer. Uh, to the uh, residents along the uh, rim of the canyon, uh, so so they will be notified. Uh, and in regard to letting the larger community know uh, know about um, the status, we will be announcing the story map through our social media uh, platforms. Uh, and and the, the main counter or, or the main number to City Hall, if someone has a general question, uh, staff will, will be able to refer uh, them and, and provide the correct information. And if they have a detailed question, again, they'll be referred to the, the fire marshal. Thank you so much. Councilmember Mason. Hey, I just wanted to ask, um, and I have a comment after, but are, uh, for areas of San Bruno that are hazards, so if there's you know, overgrown grass, dry areas, what are the measures that are being taken um, to try to prevent any future fires? Because it, it, it's been hot and this is our hot season, our Indian summers. Sure, uh, Council Member uh, Mason, I, I think what you're, um, at, at the root of your question is, we, uh, through uh, monetizing the remaining community service hours uh, that PG&E uh, had, we were able to acquire $3 million to do a wildfire mitigation project within the canyon. However, that is not our only fire danger. It's our most significant, but it's not our only fire danger. And there are other um, areas across the city, uh, some of which are city property, uh, some of which are owned by other agencies. And so uh, what is the process by which uh, we are uh, planning to address those? I, I think it's sort of the, the core part of, of your question. Uh, and so 
I think we can take that in pieces uh, with regard to private property. Uh, the fire marshal has a, a regular normal business practice of uh, approaching private property owners that uh, need to trim uh, their vegetation and reduce their fire risk. Uh, and that, that is part of the normal uh, occurrence of city business. And if someone has a complaint uh, that they uh, file, be that through SB response, phone call or email, those are forwarded to the fire marshal uh, and addressed accordingly. Uh, with regard to city property or property that may be owned by other agencies, uh, for the city property, uh, one of the things that we know we need, frankly, are more financial resources uh, to be able to address those. And uh, Crestmore Canyon uh, is in the state that it's in now because we have not had uh, the, the resources um, from our budget to go out and do a robust fire mitigation. Now, we have that ability uh, through the $3 million uh, in the, uh, that the judge has awarded to us. Uh, the approximately $600,000 contract with the three C's that the city council authorized and the judge approved will provide that fire mitigation for five years in the canyon. Uh, and what we need to do uh, for our, our other city properties is uh, grow, our, grow our resources and our budget um, so that we have the ability uh, to maintain those. and. Uh, through work with the fire marshal and our um, community services department, our, um, our landscape maintenance division <laughs> within there, uh, they will be undertaking an effort to assess all of the areas uh, that are city owned that need additional work uh, and put together a plan for us to address those. Uh, now that may come with a resource uh, request that, you know, depending on our budget, we may or may not be able to, to fund. Uh, but certainly uh, through subsequent budget cycles, we will make that information known and, and try to fund those. Great, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to thank our fire department. I know that we had the San Mateo County fires over the weekend. And then on top of that, we had the local San Bruno fire that I think was unexpected and unanticipated. So just thank you to everybody who was working all weekend. It really means a lot to our community. Thank you. Uh, and if I can, through the mayor, uh, the fire marshal just reminded me that we did do a no harm uh, fire risk assessment uh, that will be coming back to the city council. And the city council um, awarded that contract approximately six months ago. And so that work has been done, which identifies our most um, uh, risky areas. And so we will prioritize the work based on that study. Councilman Medina. Okay, I just saw your hand. Thanks. I was before. Thank you very much. I'm done. No worries. Uh, anything, Vice Mayor? Thank you. I uh, had to scroll over here to unmute myself. Um, I just wanted to say that this um, this GIS uh, story map is is pretty pretty cool. This is really nice work, uh, and I, it, not only does it really highlight some important work that's happening. Um, that uh, the public may not, you know, be aware of, and here, you know, here's a way to, to really, uh, you know, tell something compelling, something good that's happening in the city. So I, I and just the technology that that's being used here is just really, um, really impressive. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with the quality of how this turned out. I, I'm, I'm uh, really impressed with the the way this story comes across. So I just wanted to congratulate staff on doing a, a really good job with this and. Um, uh, you know, you guys keep raising the bar, so uh, be careful. Thank you. And then uh, just to, to echo what the vice mayor said uh, uh, to both uh, the chiefs, the PIO team um, for what you've done and, and the work, uh, I think it is, is something that is critical. It is important. It is something that we're dealing with in the canyon. You're taking the first steps for defensible space. Triple C's, as I've learned, that young lady um, I guess it was two years and that was her last day, not because, you know, that's just the part of the program. Uh, but as one of the chiefs told me that she was even emotional uh, leaving the program. And so these folks, let me tell you, it's work they do that I cannot. Uh, and I would probably uh, look pretty foolish trying, but they're really, really, uh, from what the chiefs have said, uh, really do a great job and provide a great service uh, for our community. And I do want to thank, this is something that goes back some years that uh, folks have wanted some some type of uh, mitigation and so i appreciate that and again thank you on the videos and the presentation um and as has already been echoed by 
the, the team here is just thank you for uh, all that the fire departments are doing uh, in all counties because obviously everybody's been stretched and been asked to do a lot and work 72 hour shifts at times. So thank you. With that, we'll go ahead and move on to um, item D, receive update on COVID-19 response efforts. Jennifer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That is a hard act to follow, um, but I'll do my best. So good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Jennifer Dianos. I'm the assistant to the City Manager. And I'm here this evening uh, representing our Emergency Operations Center public information team and we'll provide a general update on COVID-19. Uh, this evening's update includes an overview of COVID-19 statistics in San Bruno, as well as countywide information on San Mateo County's current status, including a recent change to the allowances of city park athletic fields for youth sports organizations, as well as a few local resources available to our community. City Manager Brogan and I will be available for questions after the presentation. And we'll start with our statistics. Consistently pulled our statistics from the County San Mateo Health Department in each update to the City Council. In San Bruno, the county reports that there are 338 positive cases um, of COVID-19 as of this past Friday, August 20th. The county does not provide specific demographics or further drill down on this number as it's gathered simply by the City of Residents for those that test positive for COVID-19. Countywide, there are a total of 7,788 positive cases and a total of 130 deaths. As you can see, these statistics are provided with a full, further drill down um, of total cases, new cases by day, as well as information on age and ethnicity. You likely heard on the news that there were significant problems with the state of California reporting system, of which resulted in underreporting of COVID-19 testing results to our county and local health departments statewide. The county continues to work with the state's public health department to identify and resolve these issues. Um, the county offers this information on their website. We'll continue to use the site for consistent methodology and the data that updates that are provided to you in these regular presentations. The state continues to use this information to evaluate counties and their containment of COVID-19 and will be used for the criteria to evaluate whether our county remains on the state's monitoring list. Um, as a reminder, all of these statistics are as of the date noted on the screen, August 24th, and are available on the county health website at smchealth.org. Next slide, please. It's been about a month since I last reported out to you and a lot has changed since then, which most of us, or I can pretty much assume all of us are aware of these changes that have affected us. So what is our current status? As of Sunday, August 2nd, 2020 at 12.01 a.m., the County of San Mateo was added to the state's monitoring list due to our county not falling within the pre-established criteria related to um, the COVID-19 guidelines that the state established. While on the monitoring list, the following businesses are required to close their doors for indoor operations. And that includes gyms and fitness centers, places of worship and cultural ceremonies, for example, weddings and funerals, um, offices for non-critical infrastructure sectors, personal care services, for example, nail salons and body waxing shops, hair salons and barber shops, as well as indoor shopping malls. As you can see from the map on the screen, which is directly from the state's website, our county remains on the monitoring list along with many other counties within the state, which are all identified in the yellowish orangish color that you see. I also inserted a circle on the map to show you precisely where our county, county falls. Um, this snapshot of closures was taken earlier today, August 25th, excuse me, 25th. While the status can change with very short notice, I'm unaware of any changes to the status you see here. Next slide. These closures are in addition to the previous calls for closures statewide for indoor operations, and those continue to stay the same. 
that is indoor uh, dine-in restaurants, wineries and tasting rooms, movie theaters, family entertainment centers, zoos and museums, card rooms, and lastly, bars of which must close all operations. Bars are not allowed to operate outdoors. Our Sanford Emergency Operations Center continues to operate in, and is in process of evaluating an executive order to consider outdoor allowances for the businesses that are required to close by the state. And this is really similar to the outdoor dining program that was put in place for restaurants that are interested in their patrons being able to dine outdoors. I have a little bit more information uh, later on in this presentation about business support. Since our last update, Dr. Scott Morrow, our county's health officer, issued a statement related to the business closures. The statement is dated August 6th, so it's slightly dated, um, but it is available in its entirety on the county health website at smchealth.org. Dr. Morrow continues to emphasize the need to not gather, use facial coverings, and to social distance. Next slide, please. Given our many restrictions since the initial um, shelter in place order earlier this year, back in March, I know many families have been eager to hear about city park usage, and so I'm happy to be able to share the information on this slide with you. In accordance with the state of California's return to play for youth sports, youth sports organizations are now allowed to use city owned fields for practice, conditioning and clinics. The fields um, have been closed or very restricted for quite some time. And this is a new allowance in our community. Reservations for teams and groups are required and each youth organization must adhere to the return to play procedures, guidelines and requirements, including those that require masks and social distancing social distancing. Uh, while practice conditioning and clinics are allowed, games and scrimmages are not allowed. So no games, no scrimmages. Youth organizations can reserve a field for use by contacting our community services department. And that number is on the screen, but it's 650-616-7180. And this should not be confused with any of the youth programming that the city would ordinarily offer. At this time, the city does not have this programming available or in place to the public. This is for um, youth organizations that are already established. Well, oh, sorry, not yet. While um, field use restrictions have eased slightly, it's important to keep in mind that given the current wildfires that um, Chief DeLay reported on earlier this evening, our air quality has been poor recently. When this information was posted to social media late last week, staff recommended that all outdoor users consider the conditions prior to conducting any outdoor activities for the safety of our residents in the community. The Bay Area um, Air Quality District extended the current spare the air alert, which is now in effect through August 28th. As a reminder, the city playground structures remain closed. Um, however, the city has opened the dog park on Commodore Avenue, most public restrooms, as well as most tennis and basketball courts, although these courts remain restricted to same household play only. No changes. Um, each update, we focus on sharing information on resources, and uh, we believe that the ones that are highlighted today are of high interest to the community. As a reminder, there are other resources, so the ones that I list here this evening are available for those in need, and I've attempted to put them in order by flow, uh, but no other particular order than that. I'm now start with uh, COVID-19 testing. So many residents have expressed interest in free testing. San Bruno currently has two testing sites scheduled through the county. The testing will be conducted at 975 Steve Lane as it has um, been conducted recently. And the next site date is this Wednesday, August 26th, and next Wednesday, September 2nd from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Registration is required and it fills up relatively quickly. So if you're a family member are interested in getting tested, please visit projectbaseline.com forward slash COVID-19 um, to sign up for this site or one of the alternative sites in our county. Um, and there are several sites that are located in other neighboring agencies, and that's Daly City, East Palo Alto, Half Moon Bay, North Fair Oaks, and San Mateo. I should mention that the site location and dates vary by week, so it's important to pre-register. You can monitor particular testing sites as they're made available by visiting the county website at smcgov.org. 
many healthcare providers also offer COVID-19 testing. This is sometimes offered at a low rate and may increase the speed in re receiving your test results. Um, if you're interested in testing, it is recommended that you check with your primary care physician first to see what resources may be available to you. Next slide, please. On the screen is a post that our PIO team put together um, to the community, which is a simple reminder that none of us are immune to COVID-19. Um, and it's just important to remember, wear a mask, physically distance, wash your hands, and stay home if you're feeling sick. To help communities in need, the county has put together a mobile mask van for those that do not already have a mask to wear. The van is a fun eye-catching vehicle that will travel to neighborhoods in need and to distribute and disseminate free masks to those in need. The county will announce the city of where the mobile mask van will visit, and the visits are really set up in a pop-up style in order to prevent large crowds from gathering um, and to protect the county workers and the community as well. So at this time, the van is tentatively scheduled to be in our area later this week. So keep your eye out if you see it in the street. Um, if you visit the van, uh, please be sure to use caution and social distance from others to be extra safe before receiving your mask. Next is the county's child care relief fund. Um, I mentioned this to you in my last briefing and the application period is now open. Our community has several licensed child care centers and uh, family child care homes that may be eligible to apply for this child care relief fund. The fund was established by the San Mateo County CARES Act Relief Funds and approximately $2 million have been allocated to assist child care centers and homes that are impacted by COVID-19. The grants are designed to cover one month of operating expenses and really prioritize the child care centers and homes that serve the most vulnerable populations. The application period opened yesterday and will remain open through 5 p.m. Excuse me, 5 p.m. on Friday, September 4th. The grants will range from 10,000 for child care homes, 55,000 for child care centers. So more information about this program is on the screen, but for the benefit of those that can't see the screen, the phone number is 650-283-5112 or by emailing heather at communityequitycollaborative.org. Um, you can also link to the program through the county website at smcgov.org. Um, and our PIO team has really leveraged our community relationship uh, to expand our ability to get information to targeted audiences. And we've partnered with the San Bruno Community Foundation on several occasions to distribute information to businesses in our community and to keep an open line for those businesses that may have questions during these uncertain times, um, especially when there are requirements to close indoor operations with short notice. So we continue this effort to provide the support to the chamber um, and they've put out a local survey to our businesses offering assistance. They're continuing to offer their small business assistance and recovery program and to really find out what our local businesses really need in order to reopen when allowed. Um, we've used this information to help develop guidelines for outdoor activities. As I mentioned earlier, uh, that's information uh, to ensure that we as a city are able to work with businesses to develop the tools that they need in order to sustain their businesses um, in town. And as of now, we've developed the outdoor dining program, which requires a no fee encroachment permit for limited use on public property, um, as well as a use of private property. Our EOC team is also in process of developing a program subset that will provide guidance for other business types that may be eligible for similar outdoor uses on a temporary basis and specifically while our county remains on the monitoring list um, and their businesses are not allowed to operate indoors. I will not go over the full list of business categories as we just did, but if you're interested in revisiting that, you can scroll up in the presentation. And with that, a special shout out to all of our local businesses that have remained open or have modified their operations during this pandemic. We encourage our community to shop local and support support all of our local businesses to express our appreciation for their efforts. Our PIO team put together the line, put your money where your home is. It's just a fun way to remind our community to support one another and shop local. Next 
Oh no, I'm sorry, back. There you go. Um, and so speaking of local, many of us, myself included, have our children going back to school or have already gone back to school in a whole new way. That's a new way of distance learning. This has impacted many families and having to adjust to the new needs and new definition of preparing, quote unquote, back to school. Um, when COVID-19 first impacted school classrooms, our very own CityNet services quickly put together a program to offer families in need the internet services required to support distance learning. Um, that program is still current and is available. We have um, uh, about 20 participants in the program and have capacity for many more. So if you or a family member that you may know is in need of internet services within our city limits, please contact CityNet service offices to find out more information about the program. You can do so by calling uh, their office directly, 650-616. 3100, or you can email support at sanbrunocable.com. When the city activated the Emergency Operations Center, we quickly utilized the assistance um, from the executive director of the San Bruno Community Foundation, and she created the image that you see on the screen from a hashtag phrase that our PIO team developed, and specifically our very own Officer Hampton, I would say coined it, um, and that's FB Cares. And we consistently use this hashtag, and you'll likely see it in the posts that we make on social media and the images that are used in these presentations to you, um, like several of the slides this evening. Um, for those that don't know, a hashtag is a word or phrase that is used on social media to highlight a specific topic or theme. SB Cares is a way to show support to our community, and as part of this initiative, our EOC team have identified volunteer opportunities that are available for interested volunteers and connecting them to volunteer opportunities directly. Um, this is a way for our community to give back to those in need and on our website, sambruno.ca.gov forward slash coronavirus, we have a button titled how you can help which offers a variety of ways to volunteer. Next slide, please. Um, and Given COVID-19 and our limited ability for social interaction, there are opportunities to volunteer remotely. And tonight I have one for you. Um, that's from the health plan of San Mateo, also known as HPSM. HPSM has launched a Dear Neighbor postcard campaign to help reduce social isolation and loneliness, um, and specifically to the targeted uh, vulnerable members of our community which um, could be low income, older adults, and those with disabilities. You can sign up through HPSM to receive a stack of blank Dear Neighbor uh, postcards. And here's where it gets fun. You take each card and you write a positive, encouraging message starting with Dear Neighbor on each card. And when you're done, you, you receive approximately 25 cards. So when you're done creating all of them, you mail them back to HPSM and they distribute the cards to low-income older adults within our county. This is not a program specific to San Bruno. However, it is an opportunity to contribute from home for those that don't wanna go out and volunteer physically. Um, internally, our very own senior center staff have a similar program where they outreach to senior center patrons by phone. And it's really just a way um, to keep a level of engagement with those in need while still social distancing and staying home. So about the Dear Neighbor postcard uh, program, you can contact hpsm.org. And I've inserted the direct link to this presentation to facilitate that direct connection. Um, and that will be available on our website. And lastly, as you know, um, this, this uh, slide is familiar, but social media is a tool that our PIO team has really leveraged to help get information out and get it out quickly and broadly. Um, if you're not already signed up for our city accounts on Nextdoor, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, then please follow us. It's an easy way to stay connected. We also put information on our local channel one and our website for those that are not on social media. Um, and as we all know, with the active wildfires in our region, SMC Alert and your emergency notification system is another great resource to push information out quickly. Um, this is an option for those that opt for text messages or emails and is often used in the uh, time of an emergency. 
So if you or someone you know is not already uh, registered for SMC Alert, then please encourage them to do so, so that they get our messages. Um, each of the logos on the screen are linked uh, to that respective platform, so you can easily access that if you link to this presentation. And with that, I thank you this evening. Um, that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jennifer, uh, very much for your presentation and all the information and the detail. Are there any uh, questions from uh, my colleagues? Uh, Councilmember Davis and then Councilmember Mason. Thank you. Um, you did an excellent job. Uh, Ari, you've got some competition, by the way. So thank you so much, uh, so much for that presentation, Jennifer. A couple things. First, I want to thank those uh, volunteering for the testing sites. Uh, it's so important that we're able to offer those in our community. With so many residents out of jobs, I think free testing in the community is really a must. And I, I really appreciate the coordination and the volunteering to make that happen. So thank you. Um, and then my other question, I guess, is to staff. What are, I'm not, I guess I don't understand the needs from local businesses in San Bruno. Is there anything we're not able to offer Take, for example, a hair salon that can't open up business and hasn't been able to really consistently since March. Are they able to come to the city and get a permit to be able to set up um, some sort of outdoor uh, hair salon stations um, in a parking lot or somewhere in the behind the building, et cetera? And is there much need or request for those type of things? Uh, Councilmember uh, Davis, uh, why don't I take that? And so Jennifer alluded to it a little bit, uh, but we will be um, uh, really soon this week promulgating uh, regulations uh, that will allow certain businesses that are closed to open up out, outside uh, salons in one category, as well as personal care services, um, out gyms uh, and uh, play, places of, uh, of worship, as well as uh, car card rooms. And so those regulations, they've taken some time, some time for staff to really uh, go deep and uh, ensure that all the I's and, and T's are dotted and crossed. Uh, but they, they, they just crossed my desk uh, a little bit before this meeting. And so we hope to get those out this week. Thank you so much. Mason. Just, I'm sorry, just a follow up. Has there been a lot of requests from businesses in San Bruno to be able to uh, set up business outside? So the primary requests that we have received uh, have been uh, from restaurants and we've been able to facilitate those. Uh, I think there's been sort of an ebb and flow uh, initially before the we were on the monitoring list and businesses were allowed to have some semblance of indoor dining. We really didn't have a lot of request, requests locally for businesses to set up on the sidewalks even though we very quickly promulgated those rules. Uh, once we were added to the uh, state monitoring list, I think we saw what, what a number of other communities saw, which is restaurants that had said either we're going to do very limited indoor dining and takeout, um, really saw that this could be something that is prolonged and said, you know what, we're, we're going to take towards setting tables out uh, on the public side of it. Uh, on the public sidewalk, I'm sorry. What we also allow uh, in um, our conversations with some businesses for is to take over other areas of public property. Uh, if there is an adjacent park or city space uh, or parking lot behind their business, we're willing to entertain those conversations. Uh, what we do allow that we have not had uh, restaurants really step forward uh, and, and raise their hand for is to create something like a parklet or a um, more semi-permanent uh, outdoor dining area in the parking strip. And so we want to continue to advertise that. Uh, there are a number of cities uh, across the Bay Area uh, where people have done that. It requires a little investment uh, because it does need uh, to, to meet certain requirements for safety because you will be uh, within uh, the, the public street. But we are willing to allow those uh, for a period of time uh, so businesses can advertise that investment and see the benefit of that. Uh, I think what we really had locally with the restaurants is sidewalk dining uh, and uh, the restaurants willing to, to take advantage of takeout only. Yeah, it's a, a big challenge, whether it's a restaurant, you're next door to the restaurant and, you know, you've got a business too. And so you just close off the streets, et cetera. You're impacted by that as well. So thanks so much. I appreciate that. Councilmember Mason. 
Thank you. So thanks for the presentation. I just, um, I, first of all, because um, Council Member Davis mentioned the testing, I wanted to make sure we give a shout out to Council Member Marty Medina. Um, for the public who may be watching this, um, these elected official calls happened initially three times a week. We're now down to one time a week, and they're really an opportunity for the county to give uh, information to all elected officials at the same time. And initially, Council Member Medina, I think on a weekly basis, I could see in the chat room asking about testing centers in San Bruno. Um, he also called our local supervisors and was really on top of it to ensure that we got testing here in our city and that it was free. So just a thank you to Council Member uh, Medina for doing that. Um, I also wanted to just ask a, a couple of quick questions, hopefully. Um, the first is, um, I have had a number of seniors um, ask me about masks in San Bruno Park. And for um, members of the public who may be watching this, uh, I was wondering if you could give an answer on why masks are not required in San Bruno Park, please. Sure. A um, little clarification. I wouldn't say that masks are not required in San Bruno Park. Uh, there is a statewide mask order that says when you're out in public, you should be wearing a, a mask. However, there's a caveat to that, which is if you're exercising, which is what a lot of people do in our park. Uh, and so uh, if you're in one of our parks, you may see people uh, without a mask. Uh, and even walking uh, uh, is a form of exercise and, and someone uh, can, if they state that that's a reason for not wearing a mask, um, uh, they, they are in compliance because they're in compliance with one of the exemptions. And so it truly makes enforcement almost impossible. Uh, and so we, we have had a number of those questions and calls and, uh, in various forms. Uh, and, and it's one of those things that I, I believe when our police chief was given some updates on the enforceability of the massacre, there, there, there's unfortunately so many uh, caveats to it. Uh, and the, the park is the, the, probably the most challenging uh, place to enforce the mass order because it's a park and that's what people recreate and that's an eligible exemption. Great. So, they, so it is required, it's mandated that if you're exercising, you're not required to wear it. Is that fair? You are required, if you are in our, in our park and you are not exercising, um, you're, you're required to wear a mask. However, if you are doing one of the many eligible activities uh, where you can be exempt for, from the order, um, that is okay. Okay, that, thank you. I've had that asked actually quite, quite a bit. And I think for seniors who are in the vulnerable population, it is scary. And I've had a number of seniors tell me that they've just stopped going to San Bruno Park altogether. Um, and so it is unfortunate that it, it's an exception that's allowable. Um, the other question I had was um, around the playgrounds. Is there, what, what is the schedule looking like for playgrounds um, to open up? Uh, so unfortunately, I do not have a timetable on that. Uh, that is governed uh, by the state of California and a statewide order. Uh, and so while uh, we know that they have allowed uh, youth recreation uh, with some limitations, as, as we said in the presentation, no games or no scrimmages. Uh, a few things are expressly prohibited, uh, and playground structures are one of those items that are, are not allowed to be opened um, uh, in our county or statewide. Okay. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for your presentation. Thank you. Are there questions or comments from Council? Great presentation. Thank you. I can see Marty echoes that too, Jennifer. So we, we all want to thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to consent calendar. All items are considered routine or implemented at, uh, implemented in earlier council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion unless requested. So are there any items that uh, council wants to pull for a separate vote? Uh, obviously there might be questions and stuff, but separate votes. Are there items that we, yes, uh, council member Mason. Sorry, it's a long time to get to the raise hand. Um, I, would, <laughs> I would ask that we have a separate vote on the, uh, well, I'm not even sure if we're voting. It looks like we are based on the resolution on the short term um, residential rentals. So E. E. Okay, uh, separate vote for that. 
be on E. Thank you. Um, is there items that we want to have uh, feedback or questions asked uh, of staff? Councilmember Medina? Yeah, I'd, I'd actually, actually would like to pull item G. Uh, it, it's a pretty major through fare that goes through uh, a part of San Bruno on the east side that um, I think this information is important that that street has been uh, in uh, disrepair for a while. Thank you. So, so do you want a separate vote or you just want to have staff report out and, and ask questions? To, to, pull, to pull the item basically to have staff, uh, yes, Got it. provide Thank an you. Different you kind got of question it. today, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, um, with that, let's go to item G, and that was adopt resolutions to the one Councilmember Medina was just talking about, approving the design, authorizing the city manager to execute a construction contract, um, approving the construction contingency, appropriating eighty five thousand from Measure A, uh, and a hundred thousand from gas tax, and approving a total budget in the amount of one million. Um, so uh, at this time, we're going to turn that over uh, to Director Tan, and then uh, Council can ask questions. So, um, City uh, Clerk, um, if you can pull up the uh, the presentation deck, that'd be great. Thank you. You, Melissa. So I do have a brief presentation on this project. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, Jimmy Tan, Public Works Director. Um, slide two, please. Um, next. The agenda for my presentation is as follows. I'll just provide a brief background on the project and show some pictures of the existing pavement conditions. Uh, briefly describe the bidding process and provide the results of that process, uh, the bids. Uh, discuss the fiscal impact, uh, provide some alternatives, and lastly, the staff's uh, recommendations. Next, please. So as for the background, um, back in 2017, the city received a grant uh, in amount of $673,000 from the One Bay Area Grant Local Streets and Roads, otherwise known as you know, OBAG uh, LSR. Um, it's a federal grant uh, that was non-competitive, uh, and then the $673,000 is the maximum amount that the city uh, received. Um, the initial proposed limits was along San Antonio Avenue uh, from Santa Inez to San Felipe Avenue. And this stretch of road is considered a, a collector uh, based on a state uh, roadway map and the grant is eligible to be used within the segment. Uh, staff requested a firm uh, pavement engineering uh, to perform the pavement analysis. This, the firm conducted you know, corings and deflection tests and the recommendation for that resulted in the removal of uh, 13 and a half inches of pavement uh, section and replaced with a uh, 10 and a half inch of uh, aggregate base and uh, three inches of hot mist asphalt uh, with the uh, geogrid uh, fabric uh, to be replaced you know uh, to be placed between the, the existing subgrade and the new uh, aggregate base layer um, then we determined uh, based on the um, the recommended improvement staff estimated that the grant amount will be uh, in, in, insufficient to fund the, uh, the proposed limits um, from Santa Inez to uh, San Felipe. Next, please. Here, just some pictures uh, of the, um, the existing pavement taken a couple of days ago. As you can see here, the pavement uh, is, is, you know, is in deteriorating conditions. Uh, these pictures were taken looking south uh, along San Antonio Avenue. Next, please. There's another set of pictures there. As you can see there, there's major uh, cracks along the, um, uh, the, the roadway uh, there. Uh, next, please. So the staff proceeded with the design of the project um, for the initial project limits uh, from Santa Inez uh, Avenue to San Felipe Avenue. And the scope of work includes to, you know, to, to rehab the pavement, uh, installation of new curb ramps, since it's a requirement to provide curb ramps when streets uh, or roads are altered uh, during resurfacing. Uh, there will be some additional uh, replacement of concrete sidewalk and curb and gutters work in some areas as it may be necessary to conform to new curb ramps. And there's also rerouting and replacement of storm drain facilities uh, since storm drain inlets conflict with uh, the, the ramp locations. And lastly, uh, restriping of the, uh, the pavement uh, markings. Uh, next, please. So since staff knew about the limited grant funds, um, staff structured a bid to 
provide the maximum uh, flexibility. Uh, the project was uh, separated into three different uh, bid items. Uh, one was the base bid from Santa Inez to Santa Dominga, which requires you know, this you know, pavement uh, reconstruction. And the other was the bid additive number one from Santa Dominga to San Marco. Um, and then lastly, uh, bid additive number two from San Marco to San Felipe. And so the thought was that if the base bid and the bid additive prices you know, comes lower, uh, we would be able to include them in the overall project uh, work. So next slide, please. So here's a, a figure that shows the various you know, bid items and the limits of work. And the red line you know, represents uh, San Antonio Avenue. So as previously mentioned, the stretch of, the stretch of roadway along San Antonio is from you know, San Felipe Avenue to, to um, Santa Inez. It's considered a collector. Uh, and then it's the only segment that's eligible for federal funding. Uh, the base bid from Santa Inez is from Santa Inez to Santa Domingo, which is about three blocks um, long. And the additive uh, bid item number one is one block from Santa Dominga to San Marco. And additive number two is about a couple of blocks from San Marco to San Felipe. So from Santa Inez, oh, not yet. Sorry, go back, please. Yes, thank you. From Santa Inez to Santa Helena along San Antonio is um, considered a local road and is ineligible for federal funding. So for that segment of um, the roadway there, the city received a grant in the amount of $385,200 for bicycle and pedestrian improvements uh, as part of the MTC TDA Article 3 grant. And the work uh, consists of you know, adding you know, bike share roads, fog lines, um, radar uh, feedback signs. And the paving work is not part of the grant. Uh, however, it will be included as part of the, the design. Uh, the recommendation is to uh, mill and fill that stretch instead of the, uh, the reconstruction as what's being currently done for the other uh, locations. Um, and the project's under design with design completion estimated by the end of this calendar year. Uh, next slide, please. As for the bid process um, for the project, staff advertised the project twice, uh, once on June 12th and the other on June 19th. The city received four bids and their bid prices are noted on the, uh, the slide. Um, Esquivel uh, grading and paving was the apparent low bidder uh, with the amount of $640,000 for the base bid. However, uh, the firm uh, did not provide all the requested information required to be, um, you know, as part of the, uh, you know, the complete bid package in the middle. Uh, they specifically did not include any financial sp statements as required uh, as part of the bid package. Um, so therefore, due to the incomplete bid package, uh, their bid was considered non-responsive. Uh, the second low bidder was Redwick Construction, uh, in the amount of $741,000 for their base bid. Um, based on the city's review of their bid package, it was deemed to be complete and responsive. The staff is currently recommending to award the, only the base bid for the project, uh, which is from Santa Inez to Santa uh, Dominga. Next, please. So as for the fiscal impact, uh, staff is requesting additional appropriation for the project. Uh, currently, in the fiscal year 2021, CIP budget includes a grant amount of 672,000 and a gas tax fund of 158,000 for a total of 831,000. Um, the total estimated project cost is a little bit over $1 million as noted on the, uh, the slide. Um, that includes the project management of uh, the contract cost with uh, retro construction, a contingency of about 15% and, um, and construction management inspection and material testing. Uh, so therefore staff is requesting an additional appropriation of 85,000 for measure A and 100,000 from gas tax for the project. Next, please. So there are some project alternatives to consider. Um, you know, the first is to reject all bids and rebid the project, but this may, you know, end up, you know, delaying or jeopardizing the uh, um, uh, jeopardizing the grant deadline requirements. Um, we can award the base bid and, and add, you know, and select some of the bid alternatives, but it will require require additional funding or you know, don't proceed with the project altogether and allow the grant funds to be returned um, or propose you know, using other alternative you know, funding sources um, uh, other than, you know, than gas tax and measure A's to, to do additional um, repaving work on other three segments. Next, please. So lastly, the staff is recommending um, to, uh, for the council to adopt the resolution to approve the design and, and to authorize the city manager to execute a construction contract with Redrick Construction Company for uh, the project. And it'll also improve the, con the contingency of $110,000 and appropriate, appropriating the, um, 
the amount needed, uh, 85,000 from Measure A fund and 100,000 from gas tax uh, for a total budget in the amount of um, over a million dollars for this project. So this concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions uh, from Councilmember Medina. Yes, and um, I wanted to thank staff um, for answering the questions that I sent uh, last night that they got to me earlier today. Um, just wanted to uh, bring some light to this street. Um, it's in really bad shape and there is a lot going on on the street. Um, so from Santa Inez to the south, we currently have installed um, all the utilities there. As water and sewer have been installed and we're waiting to get the design for the paving of that work. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So actually, you know, the um, the utilities from San Marco all the way to Santa Helena has, you know, have been installed already. As, you know, it's, it was done as part of the, 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 uh, the Crestmore Lomita, you know, pump station project. Okay, great. So there are two segments that we're talking about. We're talking about the MTC that is south of Santa Inez that we currently are not looking at doing the final paving yet. Not at this moment, but it will be done right. in the future. Correct. Do we have a scheduled date? And I, I guess my overall my my overall question is to the residents that live through here, along here, that take this road. We just wanted to be able to give a clearer picture of when will it all get done, right? So right now we don't have the funding yet, and the answer to your to the question is. For the MTC portion, when would that be designed and potentially paid? Yeah, so as, as, as I mentioned during my presentation, it will be designed, the estimated completion date is by the end of this calendar year. And so most likely early next year is when the, uh, the paving and, the, and the, all the bicycle and pedestrian improvements uh, will be completed. Okay. And then we're currently, um, with that one figure, we're, we're doing the base bid, which is from Santa Dominga to Santa Inez. The Correct area between San Marco and Santa Dominga, we currently don't have enough funding to, to deal with that. And it's staff recommendation that we um, move forward with the base bid and not include that at this time. Well, it, it really depends on where the funding source is gonna come from, right? And if the council decides right. that if you want to include that segment for one block um, of you know, roadway for you know three hundred fifty-three thousand dollars at this time. Um, staff can definitely include that as part of the contract, but the council would have to decide where the funding source, you know, would, would be coming from. Um, okay. So it, it's it's one of the alternatives uh, that right. you can choose to do. Right, and then the next segment from San Marco to San Felipe um, is not designed, and that also needs the the utilities to be installed. That's correct. The utilities for those the, the, those two blocks from San Marco to San Felipe it, it hasn't been installed yet. Um, so you know that is part of what we're calling it the Avenues Four Dash One uh, project. And uh, the currently right now, the the current work program uh, for the water and sewer replacement project that falls within the fiscal year 2023 to 24. Uh, for the design phase and uh, the construction in uh, 2024 to 25, but however, you know, um, you know, this project could be moved up uh, in a CIP work plan because you know the work for the avenues one three, which actually ends at San Felipe, um, um, will be completed by then. So there will be connections, you know, for the water and sewer lines, you know, um, that can be connected to the the, the the future segments, you know, along, um, you know, from San Felipe to San Marco. Right, and that that's kind of what lead, is leading to this next part of my my comments and questions are um, from the area from San Felipe all the way up to Florida. Um, that is going to be completed, uh, paved by next year of June, approximately. That's correct. Yes. So currently, right now, that the whole project is under construction uh, by a range of right. pipelines, and uh, so once the water and sewer mains are replaced, uh, all of the the roadways within that area will be repaved and currently the estimated time 
uh, is around June 2021. Great. So when we come back and look at our capital improvement program for next year would be the time that we would that if the council provided the direction to complete the avenues for one segment. If we don't do that, we're, we're looking at a street that has potentially three blocks that, that are not done. Two for sure, one, one potentially with the uh, bid additive number one. So um, I, 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 I would like to re remind my colleagues of, of this is probably a good idea to move that up. Um, you don't wanna have construction on seven blocks and then wait two years and come back and do construction again for uh, another two blocks. So um, I, I, I'm in support of this project. I, we, we have a lot of construction that needs to be done. This, this is one of our worst streets in San Bruno. Um, and um, I want to thank you for, uh, for taking the time to answer all my questions. But um, I think it's important that we, we explain to the public how, how this construction is, is proceeding and how we could possibly um, we will need to move things around a little bit to, to get it completed in a more expedited manner. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are uh, questions are on this item. Uh, Councilmember Mason. It just just a comment. Um, I think that I agree with Councilmember Medina that this is probably one of our worst streets. Um, it would be great if at some point, not, not if you have to create it, but if it exists, I know in one of the previous discussions, we heard about the plan and it's going to, it was going to be some, like something like a 10 year plan of, and all the streets will get done over time. But if we could at some point see maybe what's next. So after these, this street, what's the next year, um, not necessarily the 10 years, but kind of what's coming up. Um, cause I think it's really exciting to start, to start seeing some of this move. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments on item G, uh, council member Davis. So was Marty's, uh, comment. So thank you for those comments, Marty. I mean, I, it's important. I think that the public has visibility into what we're doing and what the plan is and understanding the big picture. Um, there are many streets in San Bruno that are bad. Um, some just as bad as, as that street. And it's, I can't ever remember a time in my life when it was really good. Um, the tree roots have always been a big part of that problem. So um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that there's progress and that there's a plan. But is there a question that you're still waiting for an answer on Marty in terms of your suggestion? I think that there is sort of, uh, the right things happen in the right order and that we give it the attention that it needs? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. The answer is that we would have, as a, as a council, we would have to push forward the design for that segment that's missing. That's currently scheduled to be designed in 23-24. So, so two years from now is to start the design. Um, we would have to urge staff to, to move things around a little bit. And, and understandably, um, we, we have limited staff capability. Uh, and and um, this is something that, um, it, it's it's a little awkward, in my opinion, from, from, from working here as the public works inspector of kind of jumping around and not doing a middle part of a street. Um, it just doesn't seem um, the, the best way of, of minimizing the impacts to the residents there. So if we can move some stuff around, some different projects around, I think that's that's the the question that I have for our colleagues and and um, for everyone to understand that um, that that those neighborhoods there they went through BART expansion, uh, they went through Caltrain's uh, work, and it's like it's time to like have a break and, and to get in there and get everything done is, 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 is what I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to do and make that decision um, when it's the appropriate time, but to bring it forward now so that as we're talking about it, that we all understand what's happening. Thank you. Cause I just didn't want that point lost and I, I sure. can, no. and so I, I, I 
I don't think staff can come back to it tonight, but I think it's their understanding that this is kind of how a number of council members probably feel. Thanks. Great. Thanks. City manager, did you have anything? City manager, did you have anything? He's on mute. Yes, I did. I was talking, but no one could hear me. Uh, That's okay. It's not, no. uh, I just saw the camera zoom in, so I assume that was my no. that was the <laughs> indicator. It's like at home. Sometimes I talk, but you know, no one's not joking. Um, uh, <laughs> let's step up on the balcony for a minute. Uh, I think what we're talking about is, uh, in particular, bid alt one. There's a reason why bid alt two is not being done because. Uh, and that's because there needs to be some sewer and water work done in those roadways and you don't want to pave it now. You want to do that work and then come and pave it later. But in particular is a uh, bit alternative one, which is on um, San Antonio from Santa Domingo to San Marco. Uh, and the cost of that is 353,000. And essentially what, what I think Marty and uh, members of council are articulating is, boy, we're doing part of the work. Why can't we do this other block segment, it, it feels frustrating to everyone to, to do part of a street that we know is bad and leave a part um, that, that we all know is bad undone. Uh, and if we step up on the balcony, this is exactly the problem we have because as a community, we don't have enough money to maintain our roles to the fashion that we need to. Um, and if money wasn't the problem, we would absolutely do this segment. Uh, and so staff went out to bid for the money with the money we had, uh, and how we normally do is we do a couple bid alternatives because if the bids come in uh, great or under what we're budgeting, we want to have a bid off there that we can do more work for the limited amount of money we have. And so that's exactly what was done in this case. Um, but we have enough for the base bid, but not to do that other street segment. What I believe is being, um, uh, requested is to go back and say, boy, where can we find the money or, uh, frankly, given our budgetary situations, not do another project so we can do this project, and what does that mean? And so if that's the direction from council, uh, we can certainly do that. We will go back and look at the other road projects that are in the hopper and say, you know what, we, we need 325000 Take a look at what we have remaining in our fund balance. And I, I, I know council knows that we, frankly, scraped them as bare as we could uh, trying to resolve our $8.2 million uh, budget deficit this year. And we delayed a number of capital improvement projects and even used $2 million of measure G to cover a portion of our operating hole. Um, and so let's, let, let's, as we talk about this one project and our frustrations that we don't have enough money to do everything we want to do, sort of step up on the balcony and realize that our, our, greater, our greater challenge is that we need roughly $8 million a year, need to be spending roughly $8 million a year to get our roads to where they are. Uh, and at last bet, we were spending about $2 million. And Jimmy, correct me if I'm wrong on that $2 million, but I know it was nowhere close to eight. And so we have to make these what feels like terrible decisions because we don't have the financial resources. Uh, and COVID punched us all in the gut um, and, further, and took more away. Um, and so I think part of the, uh, um, my response is it, we can, if council would like, we can delay the action on this um, and come back and try and find um, and give you a proposal to pull from X to pull from Y. What I'll tell you is that we thought of that and uh, we weren't recommending that. We were recommending going with um, the base bid because that's what we have the, the money for. Uh, but if so directed, we will go back and, and, and reassess and, 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 and give you a list of trade-offs. Um, and what I, what I believe is not possible, and I'm going to ask staff for the city attorney to, to opine, is for us to take an action tonight to approve the base bid and then at a later date come back and say we would like to do the bid alternative. I don't know. I, don't know, I actually don't know if technically if that's possible. And so um, because that would be another way to move forward with what we know we have money for. And then if we can find money, another 325000 to do another road segment, uh, that would be nice. But can we make that decision with the bid we have before us today at a later date? So Jimmy or Mark, if you can opine on that, I guess I'm tossing that out. The city attorney or director, is anybody able to answer that? 
So we're we're thinking. Okay. Well, um, while you're thinking too, I just want to also uh, to to put into that. Obviously, we don't want to lose an opportunity for a grant. So I just want to keep that in mind too. So if there's any concern on that. That's correct. So I think one thing that we received from Caltrans uh, is regards to what is called an E76. Um, that was back in March. So uh, six months after that is when we're supposed to start, you know, sending invoices to Caltrans. Um, and so with that, you know, we may be able to delay one council meeting, but not multiple council meetings you know, for this work. Uh, the other thing is, you know, there's a very limited amount of funds, um, a balance left over from Measure A and gas tax. Um, you know, just there, there was an available balance of 299,000 measure A and, and 420 in gas tax. So there's really not much left remaining in, in our, those two funds to be able to supplement any additional costs for bid additive number uh, one. Um, at some of the other paving projects uh, are already starting already uh, that we're, we're planning to proceed with. Um, and that is going to utilize some of these gas tax and, and measure A funds. So, um, you know, I, just don't know which other projects will be, be able to um, defer and to try to get this one block um, um, of street in here for this. Okay. Anything to add city attorney? So I, I just wanna make sure I understand what the alternative is that the city manager is proposing. Could you? So award the, base, award the base bid, but go to the contractor and uh, two to three weeks from now or uh, a few meetings afterwards if we uh, can find the 320, uh, 353,000 after we already have council action to on their bid. My gut is no. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Right. Okay, that's yeah. my gut. But. So what we're essentially, what you're essentially hearing is time is of the essence because we want to take advantage of the grant uh, when we adopted our budget, we had extremely limited funds uh, for road maintenance, and we cut that back. Um, and we, this is one of the projects that was a funded project. We went out to bid um, with the money we had and had a bid all, and we can do the base amount, but we cannot do uh, the additional uh, bid alternative one or the bid alternative two. And so, you know, unfortunately, this is one of the challenges when the need outstrips the resources. Councilman Medina. Yeah, I, I, like I, I think I tried to say earlier that I, I'm, I understand and going forward with the base bid, I'm, I'm in support of that. Clearly that we don't wanna risk any chance of losing any grant money. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's, uh, beneficial to have this discussion to, to really see how tight it is. You know, we, we can't do a block of street because we don't have the money. And um, and we'll get through this, you know, with, with COVID, that's why we were pushing for Measure G so hard, you know, trying to get that $4 million a year so that we would be able to do extra stuff and, and, and it makes more sense. So um, I I will support this uh, base bid and uh, I can leave it at that. I think it's a good discussion to have. You know, this is reality. So um, I'm, I'm done. Okay. So with that, then we have under consent, we have items A through H, but pulling E for a separate uh, discussion and vote. Is there any action from council? Motion to approve the uh, all items except E. Second. Motion made by Salazar, seconded by Medina uh, to approve all but E under consent. Roll call, please. Councilmember Davis. Aye. Councilmember Mason. Aye. Councilmember Medina. Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar. Aye. Mayor Medina. Aye. Motion Now carried. we'll go to, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, now we'll move to item E, weigh the second reading and adopt an ordinance to amend the San Bernardino Municipal Code, Title 12, Land Use, Article 3, Zoning, Chapter 12.80, Definitions, and Chapter 12.270, Short-Term Residential Rentals. Councilmember Mason. Yeah, so um, first of all, I'm really excited that this is um, before us tonight. 
Um, I, I had some kind of last, maybe final questions before we move on forward with a vote or the next step, but um, can, can someone explain a little bit more about um, C, for-profit commercial uses? This is 12.270.20. I just, I feel like I'm imagining these big parties happening next door to somebody's house every day, you know, in San Bruno. Um, and I'm starting to wonder if we need a C, but um, wh where, where would this happen? Um, and for whoever's going to answer it, it's the for-profit commercial uses section. Uh, Council, Council member, can you give that uh, code reference again? Yeah, it's 12.270.20. It's under definitions, and it's, uh, def it's a definition of for-profit commercial uses. If I may, through the mayor. Yes, please. So uh, the city manager and the community and economic development director may have something to add, but uh, we did spend some time looking at this and the idea was that these are essentially uses of the property for hire. And that's, that's the distinction uh, between this and some of the other sort of personal uses. So if you have a party at your, at, at your Airbnb, that's not covered under C, but if, you know, your people are paying to come to your party that you're doing for somebody else, then that is covered under C. Okay, so it says, but not limited to corporate events. So somebody could essentially rent your home out for a, for a corporate party. Right, it's doing it for hire as opposed to for, for personal reasons. And that's that's why we we made that, um, that's why that word is, is in there for hire to distinguish it from a personal use of the property in which the people who are hosting aren't receiving compensation. Oh, okay, okay. Um, okay, that that helps. And then um, my other question was, it's actually more general and I don't, I don't believe that this has been done and so sorry to open it, open this conversation up now, but it's something that I've been that I, I just kind of put two and two together and feel like it could be, be an issue. Maybe it's already an issue. I don't know. Um, but could we put a requirement um, on all of these to for no more than, you know, two cars? Is that something that would be within our jurisdiction? Because the other issue I can imagine is people, when you look at 120 days, you start renting your house out, you're not here, you leave your cars here, and now you've got you know, two, three, however many people meeting up, in, you know, here to rent an Airbnb, and now you've got an additional two and three cars on the street. And so I'm just wondering if that would be within this particular um, short-term rental ordinance, and could that be part of the registration with the city is to say, you know, we've informed whoever's renting this particular unit or house that they can't have more than one or two vehicles. So uh, why don't I bring the community and economic development director on, uh, but it is possible uh, to add that in. Uh, the biggest challenge is enforcement uh, of it, um, but uh, Darcy, who worked uh, very hard on this, uh, why don't you take that? Hi, yeah. And just to clarify on that last item for the group, oh, this is Darcy Smith, community and economic development director, for those of you who are listening this. On the telephone, I did that recently. I realized that's why I wanted to do okay. that. Um, so those commercial events are prohibited. And I want to summarize um, just anecdotally in San Bruno, we have not reportedly had any issues, according to the police chief, related to this. But it certainly has been an issue in other jurisdictions. And I think when we looked at our ordinance, which I really wanted to be state of the art, we wanted to prohibit those for-profit commercial uses because they were popping up in some of the areas and causing some problems. Um, and in fact, they still they still are if you, if you read the news recently. And in some cases, the hosts have stepped in and have prohibited those types of commercial operations, but um, in addition to what the host rules are, we wanted local rules in place. So related to parking, um, what, the, what the proposed ordinances states is that any existing on-site parking spaces shall be made available for the short-term rental occupants. And so what we aspire to accomplish with that is to ensure 
that if there was a renter that they that the on-site spaces were available um because there there have been um just listings that i've perused which have said that they won't make those spaces available and they'll force people to park on the street which just didn't really seem fair if you're if you're paying to stay there and the parking is available um, but as the city manager stated we could include a requirement i that there be a cap on the number of vehicles i think the challenge is just around enforceability because frankly by the time we get a complaint through our police department uh, the vehicles may be gone or it may just be difficult to cite that guest if if that it's very helpful if if um enforceability could it could that go through the revocation process too though so if you continue to have people that are renting your house causing parking issues then you revoke you can revoke the, the permit right From yeah i mean there's there are strict revocation requirements that would be in place um and i think if we had any violation of the city's municipal code we have grounds to revoke it um, and it, we would just need to drill down to kind of what those violations are. Are they vehicles being parked on the street over 72 hours? What kind of violations are they? And, and can we directly tie them to a guest of the unit? Um, sometimes these are again like transient guests, so they might be here and then leave and it's harder to tie them, their re car registration to a local residence in our city. So it might get some investigation, but might, or might require some investigation, um, but you know, we have a, a system through the police department to track complaints related to parking violations on our city streets. And if we could directly correlate that with a specific short-term residential rental, I think we would take any action that we can take related to the permits. But sometimes it's, tr it's transient in nature, which inherently then makes our job around enforcement of the code or rec revocation of permits a little bit challenging. Okay. Those were my, my two questions. I think um, I'd be curious to hear if any of the council members have any thoughts on the parking issue, because I, I can definitely see that becoming an issue in some parts of San Bruno. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments in regards to item E under consent? Uh, council member Medina. Right, so, so we, we currently don't have enough teeth in this to be able to uh, take action, or I'm sorry, would anything need to be changed in, in the current um, ordinance? So, Council Member uh, Medina through the mayor, uh, why don't I take that? Because I think it's important to sort of parse uh, the issue that, that we're talking about. Uh, the issue that uh, Councilwoman Mason brought up is can we uh, add into the short term rental regulations? a requirement that uh, short-term rental guests can only have X number of cars, right? Um, a couple pieces of that. We started talking about enforceability of that, which is challenging because you would need to uh, have the report document that that car or, or cars were tied to the short-term rental, uh, and it would have to be something that would stand up to due process. We couldn't, even if we had that regulation uh, on the books, just simply do a revocation or take action uh, simply based on complaints. And the transitory nature of that uh, would just make that level of enforcement complicated. So let's pause that. The other uh, thing that Director Smith talked about is within the ordinance right now, uh, as written, if there are any violations of our municipal code, parking or otherwise, that are documented and tied back, let's say if um, cars were uh, parked for over 72 hours or an excessive amount of parking tickets. Uh, that documented evidence tied to people that were um, short-term rental uh, guests, again, it would, be in a, it would be a process to document that. But if we had those and a, a short-term rental property was causing documented problems or racking up um, uh, violations, we could take action uh, and, and revoke, and no changes are needed uh, to what's proposed before you. I think point two. Point three, I want to uh, also say that if we do add anything to um, 
the short-term rental regulations about parking, we very well may have to um, stratify that between someone that is renting a portion of a residence between someone that is renting a whole residence. Because if you're renting a whole residence uh, as a short-term rental, our ability to say you can only have X number of cars uh, is likely limited because if you're a regular rental, we can't say you can have X right. number of cars. So it would likely only be for a short-term rental where you are, where the unit is occupied and you're just renting a, a portion of, uh, of, 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 of the unit that is a, a legal uh, portion eligible for short-term rental. Point three, I think point four that I want to make about this uh, conversation is that we are on the second reading of the short-term rental ordinance. And so any changes at this point would need to come back to the city council for a first reading. Uh, we would need to, if council didn't want to take action tonight on the second reading, uh, we would uh, have to take the direction, go back, do the work, add it in, then have a first reading and then have another second reading. Uh, and so uh, the regulations uh, would be delayed. Uh, it is possible also, uh, I guess, point five, to adopt the short-term rental regulations in this second reading, and then the council can make modifications at a later date uh, subject to whatever direction is provided. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I'm a little bit, I'm, I think I got it um, through Mr. Mayor. I, I, I think the, the better solution probably is for if you live on a street that has a bunch of Airbnbs, you should really try to get a parking permit program. And so therefore those guests do not get a parking space at all. It goes to the registered owner of the, of the unit. So um, I don't know the city attorneys here too. So that's what I would do. I, I, I coincidentally got had a complaint today of, of, Hey, there's a house on this street and they're having a bunch of parties every weekend and they take up all the parking and it's one night, right? 10 cars show up for a party. Well, if they're, if they're making a bunch of noise and you call the police, the police are going to enforce the making noise at night, but it's impossible to get, if you have a, if you're having a party and they're all bringing their cars in and they're there for one night or six hours, they're allowed to be there. So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's impossible to enforce that. So anyhow, um, yeah, this is a little complicated, but I see the, the, the problems with trying to change things at this time. Any other questions or comments, colleagues? Uh, Council Member Mason? Yeah, and I just wanted to make sure that, um, I'm, I'm hoping I understood this right, um, uh, Director Smith. I'm just going to give you an example of something I experienced, and then if we can maybe work our way backwards to make sure that we it can't happen, it cannot happen here. Uh, I went to pick somebody up that was visiting and was staying in an Airbnb, and when I got to the location, I won't say what city it was in. It was not San Bruno. Um, there was literally a, um, parallel parked um, row of cars that were already there, then a row of cars that were double parked that appeared to all be dropping people off because. When I turned around, it looked like the entire block was um, rentals, short-term rentals. And the person I was picking up told me they were renting one room, and the owner had turned the home, a five-bedroom home, into individual rentals. So every room in the house was a rental, and so were the other houses on that block. And so um, based on my read, that would not be possible. And I just want to confirm that for anybody who may have those concerns um, that, that is watching this today. Sure. So I'll answer that question. Darcy Smith, Community, Community and Economic Development Director. So first of all, our local ordinance does set a limit on the number of individual bedrooms or sweeping rooms that could be rented within a house, assuming that the owner is present. So it would be a hosted situation. And that would be up to three bedrooms. So that doesn't set an occupancy maximum but a bedroom maximum. And then, like I said, we've required that any parking spaces on the property be made available to the guests. So if there was a garage stall or a driveway stall, that would be available to those guests. For street parking, that's 
as you know, a little bit tougher for the city to regulate because it's public parking. People can park there. There's different um, regulations of the vehicle code that govern that. And as Council Member Medina stated, we also have other tools in our toolkit to regulate that impact on a neighborhood, such as a residential parking permit program that may be more effective, for example, than putting something in this ordinance, which is a stated easier, just might be tougher to um, enforce just because of the transient nature of, of it and, and our potential inability to link those cars with the short-term residential rental. Because not everyone registers their vehicle, gives their license plate. But in the situation you described, it just sounded like perhaps that city is allowing an entire house with five bedrooms to be rented out. And it doesn't appear that then they're requiring the host to make any off street parking. So again, the garage, a carport, a driveway available to the guests. And our ordinance requires that. And so if, we, if, if this were to occur and we got a lot of complaints and we, um, sent code enforcement officers and they observed maybe anecdotally or had more evidence that the t that in fact um, the guests were not, that the parking was not made available. Sometimes in the listings, it will actually clearly state like no parking made available. So then if we go out and there's a garage and a long driveway, we could again sort of have documentation that would then allow us to um, either not issue the permit or, or rescind the permit. That makes sense. But again, no, but it, it does make sense. I just wanted to ask for people who are watching. I know that there are concerns around short-term rentals, and I am prepared to vote yes on this. But I think it's important people understand and be hopefully put at ease a little bit that this is not this is going to be more restrictive. Um, oh, and I, know, I would also just in, in closing emphasize this is the first this is the first time San Bruno has adopted these regulations. So, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, we went out, we surveyed all the cities, we. We didn't just copy it from somewhere else because frankly, the city attorney and the city manager and I looked at them and thought, none of these are really what's the right fit for San Bruno, but we made our best professional recommendation. And I guess I'll, I'll just assure you that, that if we do see an area for improvement, we could bring that forward at the right time as an amendment. If we see you know, some area that, that's causing a lot of complaints from the residents, to the police department, um, certainly there would be the room to come back for an amendment um, if it's needed. And this is a local code. You can change it at any point in the future if it's needed. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the discussion. So on item E, uh, we're gonna need to take it in separate parts. Uh, we need to waive the second reading. So do we have a motion and a second to waive the second reading? I'll motion to waive the second reading. Thank you. Second? Second. I'll second. I'm sorry, Mark. Okay. Right. Mr. Medina Go will ahead. second it. Um, a roll call, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Mason? Aye. Council Member Medina? Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. And then finally, we're going to ask for a motion, a second uh, to introduce and adopt the ordinance, please. All motion to adopt the ordinance. Yes. I think we need a second. Yes. So a motion made and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. I'm sorry, who was the second? Mr. Medina. Okay. Uh, Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Mason? Aye. Council Member Medina? Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Motion carries. And thank you to staff because uh, it is good to have that on the books. Um, the now chair? we're going to, uh, yes, Council Member Davis. Just curious, is it the person who pulls it the one that really should make the motions, or how does that work? Or here's another question if we have questions on the item, can we discuss it and determine if we need to pull it separately? Or can we just discuss it and then determine? I, you know what I mean? Like I, we're at eight, we're at nine o'clock at night, and I feel bad for anybody, especially staff, that's already put a full day in, and we haven't even gotten to our really our, the the bulk of our agenda items. So I just want to figure out a way that we can sort of get the information out and get through the process without really taking a long time. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let's move on to conduct of business, uh, item six on our agenda, uh, city clerk. 
Receive update on planning study for the South Linden Avenue and Scott Street Caltrain grade separation project and provide direction on the preferred alternative for the railroad tracks and type of pedestrian slash bicycle crossing at Scott Street. Okay, and I believe, hey Juan, will we be turning this over to you this evening? Yes. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. My name is Haywan Ritchie. I'm the City Engineer for San Bruno. I'm here to provide an update on the planning study work that's been perform performed since November 2019 on the South Linden Avenue and Scott Street Caltrain grade separation project. Uh, the purpose of the study is to evaluate the various options for the grade separations at South Linden Avenue in South San Francisco and Scott Street in San Bruno. So San Bruno has been contemplating since at least 2005, providing a grade separation at Scott Street. Uh, with grant funding from San Mateo County Transportation Agency, we have since 2018 undergone this planning study project. The project development team consists of the cities of San Bruno, South San Francisco, Caltrain, and consultants AECOM, Apex, CDM Smith. This update will focus on Scott Street and San Bruno. This slide shows the agenda for the presentation. First, I'll go over the objectives for this presentation, provide background, including the future of rail in the peninsula, present the project alternatives, summarize the community engagement efforts and feedback received, provide staff recommendations, answer any questions, and receive direction. The objectives for tonight are to select an alternative for further study by the project development team. To get there, we will deliver this update, present staff's recommendation, and request your direction. This slide shows the work performed to date, including community meetings and updates to council. Um, I won't go through each one, but we've had three community meetings and at least three council updates. Um, prior to each community meeting, we mailed bilingual mailers to the project vicinity. The last two community meetings included over 2,000 mailers apiece. Uh, prior to tonight's meeting, we posted on the city's social media, including Nextdoor and Facebook, provided information on the project website, and emailed the project mailing list. There are various planning efforts along the Caltrain corridor. Uh, Caltrain did adopt the moderate growth scenario examined in their business plan. There are multiple city-led grade separation projects in various phases. Um, and so just to note that there is not necessarily a priority list, but as uh, agencies do become eligible to compete for sources of funding, depending on the phase of the completion. Um, and also high-speed rail project lay is currently in their public comment period for the environmental document. So in, related, in relation to the uh, Caltrain business plan effort, um, the following slides will show how Caltrain um, traffic is expected to increase. And so here we have on the top row, um, the current number of stops in San Bruno, about 56, and under the moderate growth scenario, those would increase to over double, which is 116. This slide shows the number of daily trains in the corridor. Currently, the existing are, is 92, and that is expected to grow to almost 400 at 398. This slide shows the increase in trains per peak hour. So currently, there are about 10 trains per peak hour, but those will increase to 24. So what does this mean? That Trains will be passing through San Bruno every few minutes. And if you picture an at-grade crossing, which I will go to the next slide, every time a train passes by, prior to the train passing, the gates will come down. Vehicles, pedestrians, and bicyclists will be prohibited from passing. When the trains pass by and are clear, the gates will go up, back up and allow for the crossings. So what this could mean is that for Currently, under um, current conditions, the gate is down about 10 minutes for every hour, but during peak service times, th that might include um, increase up to 20 minutes, about 19 minutes. Under the high growth scenario, that could be close to 24 minutes, which is practically half of an hour. So why build a grade separation? There are multiple reasons that a grade separation would be desirable. One is to protect the city, its residents and neighborhoods from the impacts of more um, trains. This increases level of safety, 
reduces congestion and decreases noises from the trains, um, train horns. So where did we leave off since November 2019? Uh, three options were presented. Um, the community meeting number two was focused on these three options, and that was to either provide no grade separation, to provide grade separation, but to close Scott Street to motor vehicles. And the third option was to provide full grade separation, even for vehicles, but that would include property impacts. Council summarily rejected option C and wanted to preserve residential properties. Option A was also determined to be not um, favorable due to the traffic impacts and the safety concerns. So option B was selected. This is just a brief overview of why option C at the worst case scenario, a number of residential properties and commercial properties would be affected. And so this option was rejected as a reminder. So the selected grade um, separation plan includes either providing an over and under crossing for a pedestrian bicyclist and closing Scott Street to vehicular travel. This eliminates conflicts between trains and the other modes of travel. So I do want to give some context to the project location and its boundary conditions. On this slide here, we show um, San Francisco, or north is to the left and south is to the right. Um, our boundary conditions are Colma Creek to the north that's, um, in South San Francisco and I-380 and our existing Caltrain station at San Bruno Avenue. Um, those structures, the creek and I-380 Caltrain are not ones that can be easily reconstructed or moved. And so those are considered um, our boundary conditions. Uh, additionally, South Linden and Scott Street are in close proximity to one another. They're uh, less than 2,000 feet away. And so what occurs at one station or at one crossing will affect the other and vice versa. Scott Street additionally is close to I-380 and the Caltrain station. And so what this means is that the tracks, because of the gentle um, increase or decrease in slope that can be experienced by a train at high speeds, um, the, the amount of rise or fall that the Scott Street or railroad can have at that crossing is not very high. So the range is two and a half feet raising and six feet lowering at its maximum. Um, while South Linden, which is a little bit more equidistant between um, Colma Creek and I-380, um, has a, a broader range because it is uh, further from those two uh, boundary conditions. So um, plus or minus 15 feet, feet for the track. So as part of the staff report package, there was a copy of attachment two, which is a summary table of the alternatives. Um, just briefly on the left-hand side are, is this overcrossing options for Scott Street. And on the right-hand side is the undercrossing option. Um, on the top row are the various alternatives for what the tracks can do, which is either to be raised partially. Um, in Scott Street, that'd be about two and a half feet. Partially lowered, which is um, lowered by about six feet. And then alternatives three and four um, leave the railroad crossing or the tracks at the same grade. Um, the reason that we have three and four here are because uh, at Lit South Linden, the road can either go fully under or fully over. And then similarly, the tracks, um, alternatives five, six, seven, and eight, we have the tracks being partially elevated, alternative five, partially lowered for alternative six, and then remaining at grade for seven and eight. And so this can be used to follow along because there is quite a matrix of um, alternatives. Um, and so just to provide clarity and um, I will be going through more detail of the various alternatives. So um, for the context of South San Francisco, South San Francisco has four alternatives. Um, there's alternative one, which is to raise tracks about 15 feet and to provide a partially lowered roadway. Alternative two is to partially lower the tracks and have a partially elevated crossing for the um, vehicular traffic. Alternative three and four are to keep the rail at grade. Alternative three, the road goes fully under. And alternative four, the road goes fully over. Um, due to the amount of traffic, uh, South, uh, South San Francisco has elected to provide a full grade separation, although all alternatives will have some level of property impacts. Um, and as an update, uh, previously had 
been requested about uh, uh, South Francisco and where they are. They will be, uh, staff will be going to their city council on September 9th for direction. They will be presenting these alternatives and recommending um, alternative one, which also corresponds with our alternative five um, because it has the least amount of property impacts, the lowest cost and the shortest construction period. So there are three alternatives for the railroad tracks at Scott Street. It's to raise the tracks two and a half feet, lower by six feet, or have the tracks stay at current elevation. Um, the difference between two and a half feet and keeping at current grade is not um, a large difference. And so those are treated as, you know, essentially one um, alternative for the tracks because there are substantial impacts to the properties in South San Francisco for alternatives three and four, whereas the effect of the impact in South San Francisco of raising two and a half feet versus grade um, will not be you know, that perceptible um, when we look at it. Um, okay, so these are images of the bicycle and pedestrian over undercrossing options. For San Bruno, this particular slide shows the overcrossing. Alternative one, again, raises the track and it's not very perceptible that it's been raised two and a half feet and provides an overcrossing. Alternative two, lowers the tracks by six feet, provides an overcrossing. Alternative three and four, keep the tracks at the same grade and provide an overcrossing. Alternatives five, six, seven, and eight are for the bicycle pedestrian undercrossing. Um, again, the rack tracks are raised by two and a half feet, alternative five with an undercrossing, alternative six tracks are lowered with an undercrossing, alternative seven and eight keep the tracks at the same grade and provide an undercrossing. So I did want to provide some images of what an undercrossing, a typical undercrossing could look like. Um, you know, the design details have not been decided um, as of yet, and so those are still details that could be um, determined, but these are some samples of the Blossom Hill Road in San Jose. Um, this, that one uses switchback element, and this is a sample of the Market Street overpass, which uses a more circular element. These are sample pictures of the pedestrian undercrossing. Um, let's see, this accommodates both pedestrians and bicycles with a ramp and stairs. So I did want to provide some um, profile elevations of what these various alternatives could look like. And really we looked at um, the alternatives where the tracks are raised and the tracks are lower. So alternative one, we have the tracks being raised two and a half feet and providing an overcrossing. Um, if you, as you can notice, the clearance needed from the tops of the tracks to the bottom of the undercrossing structure is 27 feet, which is quite high. Just for comparison's sake, over a freeway, um, it's about 18 and a half feet. And so the clearance needed is quite high. And then if we have a four foot um, overcrossing structure, what that means is that if we have an individual who's approximately five and a half feet tall, their eye line sight will be about 38 and a half feet high. This image provides um, a, a layout view. So the tracks are in green, the crossing structure is in brown, and it could be either over or under, in this case, it's an over. Um, the dotted lines show the path of travel from for the pedestrian or bicyclist. Um, this overcrossing has the longest path because the amount of crossing and vertical clearance needed requires longer length. Um, there are maximum slopes that we're allowed to have for ADA. And so to get to meet those slopes, um, it requires a longer crossing. This is alternative five. The tracks are partially raised two and a half feet and there's a pedestrian bicycle undercrossing. Note that the clearance required under the train structure is 10 feet to the bottom of the tunnel. Um, there was a question from council member Salazar previously regarding the width of the undercrossing. Currently, um, the width is estimated to be at 20 feet, which is similar to the crossing at Homer Street, which we saw a picture of earlier. Um, this width can be increased, um, but this does mean that the crossing may, will be lowered. So for approximately every five additional feet of width, the crossing is lowered approximately half a foot. 
Um, Council Member Davis had also asked if there were another similar uh, undercrossings to what might be seen as this um, option or this alternative. And uh, previously cited was the Homer um, crossing in Palo Alto. Um, since then, ACOM has let us know that there's the Mayfield Avenue undercrossing near San Antonio Station and Mountain View, which is similar in depth. Um, the width of their ramp is about five feet, um, but our width can be wider, uh, about 10 to 12 feet. I did take the liberty of inserting a couple slides um, so you can take a look at the Mayfield undercrossing. Um, every site is unique, and so the design elements may vary. I will say that I think, I believe the width is wider here um, from the tunnel to uh, the ramp and stair structure. Um, but I did want to give an impression of what it might look like, um, you know, with similar depth. So alternative five would have the tracks being raised and providing an undercrossing. This does provide the shortest path of travel. Um, I actually didn't mention, but the first option with the tracks being raised and overcrossing was about a quarter mile to get across. This one is 580 feet, which is about 0.11 miles. Alternative two lowers the track and provides an overcrossing. Similarly, so the tracks are being lowered six feet. We have the 27 feet of clearance, the overcrossing structure. And again, this means that the person's eyesight may be around 33 feet high. So there's an overcrossing with the tracks lowered layout. Um, and this length is longer at 0.18 miles. Alternative six, which provides a track lowering with an undercrossing, uh, which is not recommended because of the depth of the undercrossing, does show similarly 10 foot clearance um, with the tracks being lowered. And this length is somewhat similar at 0.17 miles. Um, so staff did go to the community for community meeting number three. Um, it was originally scheduled for late March, but due to COVID, it was postponed uh, after there was a level of comfort with having taking public meetings virtually. Uh, we scheduled the public meeting um, and it occurred late June of this year. We had a community meeting on June 22nd. It consisted of a presentation similar to this one and a follow up with question and answer session. We had a separate follow up question and answer session on 24th, two days later, for those who may have missed the first meeting or had additional follow up questions. We sent out 20, nearly 2,500 mailers, sent updates to those on our contact list, posted on Nextdoor, and updated our project website. There were 21 attendees at the first meeting and 18 at the second. Um, there were a couple speakers who made comments similar to the first bullet point, um, but I will say. Uh, note that the rest of the comments were individual comments made by um, an individual each. Um, so what I had heard was, or what we had heard was that uh, the overcrossing was preferred not because it was, you know, there's a strong desire to have the overcrossing, but because the under uh, concerns related to undercrossing. Um, concerns related to homeless encampments, reduced visibility of pedestrian bicyclists using the undercrossing, stormwater issues. Um, we did hear back, I uh, had requested information for the police department regarding any known homeless issues at the Euclid and Sylvan locations. Um, and the response I received was that at least for the last year, they've had very few, if any, calls of um, homeless issues in these undercrossings. Um, they attributed this to ample lighting because they cannot remain out of view. Um, for this reason, police did have a preference for an overcrossing to maintain clear sidelines, um, similar to what some of the um, residents have mentioned. Um, there was a des desire by one individual to keep an at-grade crossing with no grade separation. Uh, someone had asked whether a pedestrian bicycle crossing was needed at all. Um, one commenter noticed that the terminus was in front of a uh, resident and those details could still be worked out, uh, but it suggested that be moved to align better with an intersection or completely moved to Tamfran. Um, one resident re requested confirmation that residential properties would not be acquired um, and surrounding properties affected by the lowering or raising of the railroad construction. And that was confirmed that that would not happen. 
and um, one individual did request sound walls with the pedestrian bicycle overpassing. So there are um, really two decisions to be made, and one is related to the railroad tracks. There are three alternatives at Scott Street that's raising it two and a half feet, lowering it by six feet, or keeping at grade. Um, the pedestrian bicycle overcrossing also we can't um, there's a need to determine whether we prefer an overcrossing or an undercrossing so there are three possible track elevations which i had just mentioned um, i do want to um, briefly mention in a, in a broader project um, for south san francisco all alternatives will have some level of property impacts um, with the first alternative being the lowest, so uh, alternatives one and five, which in our case is over and under crossing with the tracks being raised. Um, for There will also be um, an increased costs with every additional, sorry, uh, the other alternatives ranging from about 1.2 to twice as expensive. Um, additionally, the property impacts do increase from um, alternatives one, two, three, and four, with three and four having the most substantial property impacts in, in South San Francisco. Um, and so I will be providing some conceptual renderings. Um, these were not available at the time of the community meetings, and so um, I do want to present them here. Um, I believe there may be community members in our meeting tonight. Um, the renderings are for three views um, on Scott's, sorry, on Herman, looking north at Scott, looking east toward the tracks, halfway between Scott and Bayshore, and looking south near Bayshore Circle. So these are the current conditions, looking north. This is a sample of what raising the tracks and an undercrossing might look like. And then this provides the view of what an overcrossing might look like. And, and you will note that the crossing structure is quite tall um, relative to these one and two story buildings. These are current conditions looking directly east. This is what an undercrossing might look like, and then an overcrossing. Um, these are still very conceptual. No detailed design decisions have been made yet, but uh, we wanted to provide um, an impression of um, the height of the structure. Current conditions looking south near Bayshore Circle. Um, these, this is the undercrossing option. Uh, this crossing with the length of the ramp would actually lend itself well to having the landing at Bayshore Circle. And, you know, a, an opportunity in the future may be to connect through Bayshore Circle um, this crossing to more directly to Tamfran and BART. So there are some design considerations, as you had seen. Um, the structure is quite tall, and that's because over tracks, 27 feet of clearance is required. Over freeway, it's 18 and a half feet. And the maximum slope that we're allowed to have is 8.33 for ADA. And for every 30 feet of rise, we do need a five foot landing. So there are various advantages and disadvantages of pedestrian and bicycle crossing options. Um, some of the advantage of the overcrossing is that it's easier to construct. There's less disruption to the railroad operations, and it may potentially be less costly. However, I do want to say that the undercrossing and overcrossing will likely not be the bulk of the cost. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the railroad tracks. Um, but there could uh, the overcrossing could potentially be less costly if we do not need to do substantial um, utility relocations, which are you know unavoidable with the undercrossing. Um, but it may actually still be required on some level. It really depends on what's there and where, where they're located. Some of the disadvantages of the overcrossing is that it makes the ramps uh, or the crossing more difficult because the ramps are much longer. And there's a greater visual impact, um, as you had seen in the conceptual renderings. Some of the advantage of the undercrossing is that it's easier for pedestrians to cross because they are shorter um, and they are a lower visual impact. Some of the dis disadvantages are they're more difficult to construct a greater impact to railroad operations during construction, and they could potentially be more costly due to the um, utilities. 
So for these reasons, um, staff is recommending alternative five, which is to raise the tracks partially by two and a half feet and provide a pedestrian bicycle under crossing. Um, some of the next steps would be to, after uh, direction is provided on the preferred alternative, to prepare, prepare conceptual design, cost estimate, and renderings of preferred alternatives, complete the project study report, and then to seek additional funding for future for next phases. Um, currently, there are numerous projects that are you know, various stages of development. Um, and so the sooner that we complete our phase, um, we can request additional funding for the next phase. Um, and the cities do compete with each other for limited funding based on the status of their projects. And with that, I would be um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for the report. Uh, colleagues, if you'll start to get your questions, so we'll just go around the room, but also to the, those in attendance, is there anybody from the audience that would like to uh, uh, comment tonight on this topic? If you, if you do, if you could uh, please uh, sign up with the virtual hand, that would be appreciated at this time. I do see one person I thought was going to speak, but could maybe not. Uh, okay. So, um, okay, we do have uh, uh, someone and the city clerk, if you would be so kind. Oh, it looks like they went away. Um, I saw. Well, uh, phone call. No, I saw the hand for um, Hang Sung Ji. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring you in the room for just a moment to see if you wanted to speak. Hello, Hang Sung, did you want to speak? Um, I've removed them from the room. I'm not sure if they did want to make a comment. If I'm not seeing anybody at this uh, at this time, so we will now bring it back to council um, for questions. Obviously, we're being asked uh, to give uh, that direction and uh, comments to staff on the uh, the elevations or the lowering and uh, whether it's underground or above. So, who would like to go first? Councilmember Davis. And and that's only because it took time to get the participants and raise my hand. Technology. I um, you know, actually in preparing for tonight's meeting, I had to review a number of uh, council packets or council videos to reprove the minutes. And I did see a video of us back in February when we were all together sitting in a council meeting. So I really do miss those days. Um, uh, so my comments, you know, this is a tough decision. It's not a very easy decision for me to make. Um, I think the ideal situation would be to have an undercrossing at street level. And I could support that fully if it was at street level, um, similar to the other undercrossings we have in San Bruno. Um, they're not dark, they're not dungeons, they're not hidden away from public sight. So I, I guess what I can do is support an undercrossing that I can have a better understanding of what the design is gonna look like. It's very difficult for me to say, yep, one way or the other. Um, I believe that the overcrossing is just a really big and bulky thing, but I believe that that's what the residents want. And I think that they are afraid of the homeless population, the urination, the, the problems with undercrossings when you really can't see um, because it is below grade. I know we're gonna raise the tracks a little bit, which is a recommendation by staff, but I'd be interested in what my colleagues have to say, but I really struggle to support an undercrossing of the potentials that we don't have in our city right now, but the potentials that we really could. Those are my comments. And any questions uh, at this time, Councilmember Davis? No questions. I think uh, staff report has been very good. So thank you so much, Haywan. Okay, why don't we move on to Councilmember Medina for uh, questions and comments, please. Yes, thank you. Um, most of my questions were from last time and, and um, I, I do concur with Councilmember Davis. Um, just, I wanted to clarify a couple things. For a project this big, we have very few community input on this last decision. So that that's where my hesitancy would be. I don't live there. 
I haven't heard anybody say too much about it. I remember at two meetings ago, but since then, you know, we, we have this huge project and we don't have community input. And so I'm really concerned with making a decision and, you know, it is COVID of course, and we try to get people to um, be aware of th these meetings. It's just like, we don't have a scoreboard on, on, you know, 23 people want this and, and two people want that. Well, that's pretty clear, right? Here we got three comments and two from two two months ago, right? Or something like that. And maybe maybe staff could kind of shed a little more, shed a little bit more light on that of how much did they get any phone calls? Did they get any emails? Where what's the scoreboard? Any oh, other, I, I, hold on, hey one. Any other questions? So we'll take them all at once. You know, I, I sure. I um, but we. I kind of asked them last time. I think. I think we, we heard that there's no complaints from the police, and we could put some provisions uh, requiring security cameras, um, uh, lighting, uh, maybe a a, a emergency uh, button or something. If there's something happens in there, um, we can engineer that. Just that. Um, Mr. Mayor, my, my biggest hesitancy is here is that we don't have much community input. You know, there's a handful of people that are, are talking about this massive project that is going to go on. Um, so I, I guess my question is how, how important is that we make a decision going one way at this point? Um, can, can, um, can we do anything more of, of giving the residents there a true say in what's going to happen to their neighborhood. This big, this big flying 33, 30 something feet in the sky, looking over everybody's backyards. I mean, I wouldn't want that if I lived there, you know, but then again, am I going to be walking underneath that uh, crossing? How often is it used? So um, those are kind of my concerns there. Um, and at the last meeting too, we talked about, um, who's going to take care of it, who's going to maintain it. And we, and we, we were told we can all work that out in the negotiations. And, and, but, um, I think it's, for me, it's, it's the lack of community response here of, of knowing what our, our residents that are going to be impacted by this every day of their lives. What do they want? Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Mason, so your mic just went live. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's, I, well, first of all, I'm, I am really glad to hear the mention of some consideration over the across the street from single family homes. I feel like it's a story we've heard before, and I'm glad that in this case, it's being taken into consideration ahead of time. Um, I, I do agree that I think that the overpass not only is going to um, take away some potential privacy and not necessarily go with the character of the existing neighborhood and maybe the neighborhoods that will be there in, in you know 20 years as um, as we see more industry maybe coming in, but I think also um, taking into consideration um, something that I, I think we briefly discussed, but I am really curious to know again about the noise. Um, if we do the uh, the under um, Instead of doing the overpass, if we have the if the option of lowering the train track, I think it was well, options five and six. Is there a difference in the noise there? I know from just taking having taken the train myself that overpasses, oftentimes there's a um, a vibration, so you're not only hearing the tracks, but you're also hearing the metal from the overpass. So that is for me not not a first choice. Um, just thinking about. Um, the impacts on the community. And then as far as the concerns over the, you know, potential nuisances that could be created there, I've taken BART and I feel like a lot of those nuisances are on the stairs just getting to the parking lot. I think those could happen outside or inside. I do think that one of the um, ideas that Council Member Medina had I definitely support is asking for security cameras. The other thing that I have seen that I think is somewhat effective is the playing of classical music. Um, so 
So I would just say that as far as um, my preferences, that they would be five and six. Um, I agree with Councilmember Medina in the sense that I, I don't really know because as I mentioned in the last meeting, we're not getting numbers of how many people cho choose what and what stickers were put on which you know designs. But I think if we're being asked tonight that five and six would be my preferences and I would say that the majority would go towards whichever one is going to be less noisy um, and I do think it's really important that we have uh, a maintenance provision in place uh, and that we actually are holding everyone accountable to that agreement because if nobody's held accountable then we're going to end up with more problems thank you thank you uh, vice mayor Salazar yeah, I, I agree with a lot of, of what's been said. Um, I agree with uh, Council Member Medina around uh, the public input. It would be great to have more input uh, from the people that are actually going to be using this, you know, whether you know, we have uh, people with strollers, people in wheelchairs, uh, crutches, crutches or walkers or anything else that you know, would be impacted by having to go up uh, a bunch of switchbacks or something to get over the thing versus uh, some kind of a shortcut underneath. Um, the one comment I did get from somebody I know in the area that um, would use that crossing was very hesitant to have to go underneath something that's dark and possibly you know, full of garbage or homeless people or something else. Um, looking at the other examples, I, I did you know do a Google search and try to find some similar under crossings that, you know, could give me an idea of what it would look like. And a lot of the other examples tend to have uh, some sort of an open plaza area in front of it that would allow extra light to come in through the tunnel. And we just don't have the room for it. And, you know, looking at a satellite view of the area, um, you know, it's um, the, even coming up on the other side, I'm not sure where people would end up, but I'm not sure if they'd be somewhere behind one of those uh, commercial properties um, or if you know they would emerge um, I, I'm not sure where, where they would pop up on the other side because I know on the Herman side we we have street access on the other side there's um, businesses that abut the tracks very, very closely so um, I, I don't know if we would have to keep tunneling uh, past them and then come up on the next street which would make that for a, a very very long and probably pretty spooky tunnel, uh, probably not one I would want to walk under. So, um, it, it, you know, when we look at these cross sections, it definitely looks like a good solution. But when we start um, really picking apart how it might actually come, um, it w what it would look like uh, in real life, then it, there's definitely a lot more questions, I think, than um, than answers around, you know, any, anything that would help me make a, a, a confident decision that, that it's the best possible solution. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I still agree that it, it probably has the least impact on the neighborhood, but if nobody's going to use it, then why even build it? Just close it off and, um, you know, make people walk to, to the next, uh, to the next uh, possible crossing. And, you know, just, kind of thinking completely outside of the options that are here, is there any version of this where we uh, don't do an overpass or an underpass and just keep a pedestrian only crossing at Scott Street um, that's at grade? I, I know that there's been improvements in, um, you know, the, the safety features that are available at, at those intersections where we could have better barriers, um, you know, that would prevent people from walking around and something, you know, something that would be closed off. And I know we looked at the traffic study um, and, you know, it, it's, it's bad with a lot of trains. It's even worse with no crossing. So cars are already not going to cross. Um, and if pedestrians could easily get across and just wait for their turn to come across, that's not going to have a queuing issue. Um, but I'm wondering if that's, um, is, is there a reason why that was not considered an option that's it thank you um you know i i did notice we have two people in the room and the 
gentleman that had wanted to speak um, was back on the iPhone. So considering we wanted to have um, uh, some input, why don't I, uh, with council permission, and we're going to uh, call on uh, the speaker. And that's who it had his hand. City clerk. Okay. Hang Sungji, I'm going to bring you in the room again. Hi, can you hear us? Yes. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Um, whenever uh, you're ready, you can start. Sure, no problem. Uh, sorry for the microphone issue. And uh, it's my honor to share my opinion with all the uh, city council members there, uh, vice mayor, the directors, and the uh, city manager, and all officers in City Hall. My name is Han Song Ge. I live in Scott Street. And uh, I appreciate your design and your idea, your opinions to this uh, crossing, uh, the, the regretting issue. And for me, I, by my, uh, in my view, so the overcrossing will be a better idea because of the one is a, sa a safety issue, the homeless issue, and also the stone water and issue and so, something I, I i want to mention that, that i believe the lower down the railway and the make over crossing will be a bad idea because of the uh, the noise control at the same time i propose the south wall along herman street because the country will be increased to four times than before if it if we do nothing on this street, so the residents adjacent to the Herman Street will will very difficult to live here because of the noise issue. If the people raise the railway, so the dust will, will become a big issue. So the sound wall, no matter it's a concrete sound wall or it's a transparent um, noise barrier, both of them are working. So this is one important thing. and. Um, I, I noticed the uh, the um, so the civil engineer mentioned the one disadvantage of the overcrossing is the long distance of the travel paths. To resolve the ADA issue, we can use uh, an elevator similar at, similar in the country station, not far away from here. Because uh, in the country station, I noticed. I noticed that there is an elevator there. We can use a similar solution to benefit for the people uh, who uh, who use in the wheelchair. So um, um, it is, um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So this is the uh, the thing, and uh, I, I believe this is the most the thing I want to say. And thank you very much. It's my honor to share those things with you, and I hope you can consider those things, especially the sound wall to, to protect the the property value around here and improve the environment of our community and uh, let the new residents come here and uh, let the old residents stay here and keep our uh, uh, health and uh, ju just uh, um, make the community better and better. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Okay, with nothing, uh, no one else with their hands up uh, from the audience, we're going to keep it at council now. Um, I'll have just a, not to recap on what everybody else has said, but um, we had a couple questions. Of course, of course the stormwater kind of was an element that was brought up the last time we had met. Um, and Juan, you had mentioned property impacts, and I just want um, to be clear and clarify because I think that's what gets people concerned. So any property impacts are in the city of South San Francisco, not in the city of San Bruno. Because even on Tamfran, you know, I had I had somebody who emailed and was very concerned about the, hearing their property would be uh, would be taken. So I want to make sure that's clear. Um, the other thing is is that um, you know when I held a meeting out at uh, Bayshore Circle Park, which was loud back then, that was a while ago. But that's when we were trying to decide whether to have a grade set or not, et cetera, right? And there was a there was 50 people that attended, and and major and their main concern and worry at that time was uh, their homes, eminent domain. If the grade separation went through, it could be 27, 32, 35 homes. It really wasn't defined at that point. And they remember a time when BART came through, and that also the fifth edition was possibly going to feel that. that. Um, as far as uh, being relocated. 
And so I think that may be a part of a reason, because I think that, uh, as you know, even when we had the meeting at the senior center, once it was like, that's off the table, there was a, a sigh of relief in some ways. Um, and I even talked to the gentleman who um, uh, kind of helped facilitate the neighborhood in, in coming to that meeting that night, who ended up not speaking because that measure came off the table. So it seems um, it's important, and I'm trying to figure out what staff has or hasn't done. I think that's fair. Um, I don't know if staff's been writing down some of the questions. I mean, I've written them down too. I can uh, regurgitate them or whatever works best. To the mayor, uh, Devon Grogan, city manager, why don't I try and um, uh, recap some of the questions. Uh, I might toss a few to Haywan or our other partners, either the uh, consultants or I, I believe we had a representative from uh, Caltrain on uh, last time, and I, I believe uh, that is true looking at the attendees list uh, this time as well. Uh, so why don't I begin by saying I re fully recognize and staff fully recognizes that this is a very difficult, uh, impactful decision uh, for the city council. Uh, I know at the study session we talked uh, a lot about why this decision is for the city council uh, due to the need to continue to progress forward uh, and develop a shovel ready project that can compete with funding. Uh, and all of the other great steps, uh, non-separated crossings in the county uh, are essentially want to be where we are and further along, which is to have a shovel-ready project that can then compete for this uh, state and federal funds uh, that will fund these great separations. Uh, a absolutely critical project to protect uh, the safety of the community uh, with the knowledge that we have, which is the uh, traffic on the railway uh, will certainly increase uh, and uh, further deteriorate uh, safety uh, issues at the crossing. So there were a number of things raised, um, uh, and I have a potential um, path forward that I would like to uh, suggest to, to, to the city council. But why don't we step uh, through some of these issues? I think there was the issue with regard to stormwater uh, that was raised, uh, and that is being raised because we have an existing issue with our grade separation uh, at uh, San Bruno Avenue, uh, at the Caltrain station, uh, likely uh, poor engineering uh, design. And so with, uh, if we go with a underpass, uh, we certainly know that uh, stormwater uh, will be an issue, uh, and, but is a, an issue that can be uh, designed around and has been successfully designed around uh, for under crossings. Um, uh, throughout the region, uh, the state and the country, I think we in particular have a unique issue uh, with regard to our existing great separation at, at San Bruno Avenue. Um, that is a challenge in, in floods during heavy rain events. Uh, with regard to um, some of the concerns that were raised within undercrossing, uh, potential uh, homelessness or uh, quality of life impacts, uh, significant issues, issues that um, uh, uh, have to be taken into consideration uh, when you're talking about an underpass. Uh, there could be mitigations uh, that uh, we can work on vis-a-vis uh, -vis maintenance agreements, vis-a-vis -vis, um, appropriate design and how the underpass uh, is designed uh, and other elements uh, be there having light wells uh, in the undercrossing, if that's possible, so it's not a completely um, uh, area where there's only light on, on either side. And, and so there, there are certain design elements that uh, can be incorporated and refine them, themselves over time. Uh, it was mentioned uh, with regard to noise, potentially having the track lower uh, may add um, or, or decrease the amount of noise and be beneficial to the neighborhood. Uh, I believe when Caltrain addressed that at our study session, uh, the, an the answer there was there may be some impact, but they really haven't noticed a, uh, a significant decrease in noise by um, slightly lowering tracks, meaning that the tracks do not go fully underground, which is not possible here at Scott Street. Uh, and the main noise uh, concerns are from the horns that sound because we have a non-separated crossing and that will go away once we have a great separated crossing 
the horns will not have to sound uh, when, when they pass by. So one of the, and then there were significant uh, questions about community outreach uh, and the fact that even pre-COVID, the outreach that we did for this project, uh, once the decision was made that there would be no property impacts here in San Bruno, uh, there was not a ro ro robust in engagement and, and, and feedback. And what I can tell you is that's not for a lack of trying. Um, I think what, one of the things we all know is that we are in the planning stage and the reality of this crossing and whatever design it, it will be uh, probably will not occur for the next five to 10 years. Uh, and, and so many people I think in the community do not feel the gravity of this decision because the project is so far out uh, in, into the future. And so what I would like to proffer to the city council is it's important to make a decision tonight, uh, but that decision of overcrossing or undercrossing uh, may be something that uh, you feel that you cannot make tonight. And the recommendation I want to toss out is uh, to go with alternatives one and two and five. That does a few things. It provides uh, certainty for our partnering agency, South San Francisco, with the elevation of the track, uh, raising it uh, 2.5 feet. It provides us with the option to go back, do further study, do further analysis, albeit at a, at a greater cost. And so for this next phase of, of conceptual design, we'll be studying here two options in San Bruno, uh, the option of a overcrossing and an undercrossing with the tracks raised 2.5 feet. Uh, but that will also allow us additional time for uh, to try and get uh, community uh, members more activated and engaged in the project uh, and try and have uh, some sort of a dot voting exercise where uh, the community can opine on the various options. I will say the, the one thing about the cadence, even though we did community outreach, in between the time where we had the last community meeting and the study session and today, that's when we had our renderings done. And so the community has not seen the renderings of what the overpass uh, would look like. And what we know from the community outreach that we did do and the feedback that we received is that many were fearful of what an underpass would do. Uh, and then we think uh, sort of, and we'll say that that's why they gravitated to the overpass. But without those renderings on how visually impactful uh, an overpass will be in the community, it may not have been enough for the community to, to really say, I want X and I want Y. So I think we can do a, 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 another outreach effort for community engagement. What I want to caution the city council and the community is we may be in the same situation where we don't have the community really saying, I want X or I want Y, or it may be a tie, right? Uh, and, and that's why you guys sit in the lovely seats that you sit at, you sit in because you have to make those tough decisions that I'm glad I don't have to make them. Um, but I want to toss that out because it's an option where, uh, albeit at, at a little bit more cost, and we'll have to go to the agencies and say, hey, San Bruno uh, didn't narrow it down uh, from uh, eight options to one. We narrowed it down from eight options to two. Uh, we would like to study uh, two options. It provides certainty uh, to South San Francisco uh, because with option one, uh, they can proceed forward with a undercrossing um, uh, for their vehicular traffic. Uh, and actually for them, that's the same in option one and option five. And so they can really proceed forward uh, with their documents and, and we would then uh, be able to do a little bit more uh, definition on Siobhan, you're muted. Not the whole time, right? Uh, yeah, could you start from the beginning again? <laughs> No, not the whole time. When I got muted. Um, but what I was saying is that we could, um, uh, by choosing option one and five, it gives uh, South San Francisco certainty for them to proceed with their uh, uh, likely undercrossing uh, for vehicular traffic. But it also allows us to do more study uh, and have that conceptual design of what design elements we could build into a undercrossing, be it light wells, be it a wider crossing so it's not as dark. Uh, be it potentially um, design elements so it's not this uh, scary dark place and, and maybe design elements that may pre prevent some of the uh, 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 homeless activities or uh, things that um, uh, the community uh, express that they would not like. 
uh, bring back that while also uh, doing more analysis on what a overcrossing would, would look like and, and, and having a conversation should we be able, be able to coalesce enough community members around the topic to actively engage and provide you with more information. Uh, the other thing that was mentioned that I did want to talk about, and I think this was mentioned by one of the public comments, of what about an elevator shaft? Uh, so you uh, you may um, sort of think you've seen that other places. Uh, the examples I think of are on the East Bay, the Emeryville BART station uh, that has a overcrossing, uh, but it's not the long ramps, but it's essentially a set of stairs with a very small switchback. And then the ADA path to travel is not a long ramp, it's an elevator. Uh, those pose challenges in a situation like this uh, because uh, of elevator maintenance if the elevator goes down uh, and it's not like at a facility like a BART station or a train station where they, they have other elevators in the building and have elevator technicians and other ways for ADA path, ADA path to travel. And so in sort of satellite areas like this, what you really see are is infrastructure built uh, that uh, is essentially foolproof for ADA access. Someone won't get to that and have no ability um, uh, to cross that path. And so it's typically a long ramp with the switchbacks or it's an undercrossing. Uh, and, and so that's why we did not uh, go toward the elevator option. And I, mind you, with the elevator option, it would have to be open 24 hours a day and you would uh, have those same uh, potential elements of um, concern uh, that could occur with, within an elevator, people sleeping or doing all sorts of terrible things that we don't want to say in a public meeting uh, in an elevator. Uh, so that, that's what I'd like to toss out. I know I uh, probably hit on most of the um, comments. Um, uh, well, you, you, you did hear about, you know, security cameras, emergency button, et cetera. You did hear that. Um, the one thing that the vice mayor said, you know, what if, or why could it not be at at, at the grade? And, and just but as is. Right, um, and so that was uh, talked a lot about uh, when we made the decision to close Scott Street to vehicular traffic when the grade separation project uh, occurs. Uh, and there's a lot of data around the amount of traffic that's projected to, to, to um, occur at this intersection and the best practice uh, and is to have a separated crossing where you have the train traffic on a different elevation as vehicle pedestrian bicycle uh, or, or, um, or 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 cars and so um, essentially our understanding now is for new crossings uh, that are being built and established they're really not doing uh, crossings where everything is at the same grade uh, and any crossing that is not grade separated um, with the projections for our railway, uh, frankly, uh, every community, uh, my understanding that has a non-separated crossing uh, wants to explore ways, uh, if they're possible in that area, to have them separated due to the safety impacts. And it's important, it's an important thing to protect the community. And hey, Juan, if you know more, specifics on that or the Caltrain representatives on the uh, call want to chime in, uh, feel free to raise your hand and we'll have a city clerk bring you in. Okay. I like council member Mason had, um, uh, had a question about noise. And so if I can have, um, there's Millette Litzinger of ACOM and also uh, Peter DiStefano, he is also with AECOM. Um, but if Millet, if you wouldn't mind speaking um, about the noise component. Hi, uh, yes, good evening. This is uh, Millet Litzinger from AECOM. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Awesome. Uh, so just to the point to, uh, I will speak to the noise one, but just talking about, um, you know, what happens if you do nothing. I think, um, you know, one of the big points that we need to make is um, the future plans for Caltrain and their business plan is to significantly increase the number of trains over over time. So the potential opportunities for conflicts between pedestrians um, and vehicles at at-grade crossing just it increases significantly. And 
So, you know, uh, safety is a big reason why we want to do this. And not only you're going to have more trains, but they're going, also going to um, travel faster when electrification also gets implemented. So um, that's one of the big reasons why you really want to, um, uh, one of the goals of grade separating is so you do increase that safety and provide that separation between those modes of traffic. Um, I could add a little bit more about the noise study. Um, last time we were at the study session, I made reference to um, um, AECOM had recently done a noise study for the city of Palo Alto and their grade separation program. They have several options and alternatives that we're looking at that you're, are similar to here, like a hybrid, um, a viaduct, which would be like your, um, where you're the ro road, where um, the, you have elevation on the roadway. So the, what we determined from that study was that um, this, as um, the was already suggested, was that the reduction adding the grade crossing, yeah, adding the grade separation eliminates the hoing noise, and that's the majority of um, a sound noise increases in, in the neighborhood are related to the horn noises. So just by grade grading and eliminating um, the need for the horns to um, blow their horns as they cross the ag grade crossing will be a huge improvement. Um, when we started on this Palo Alto study, looking at all the different alternatives and how there were differentiators with whether you elevated the grade or you lowered the grade, there really was not a significant detectable difference by the ear of all of those options. So we really didn't find that whether you lowered or raised um, that it made a significant impact or um, change in the noise level uh, in comparison to the reduction in the horn noise. Um, I think the other comment I, we talked about as well is with um, electrification, the train noise is generated from a different location from the diesel engines. It comes from the bottom of the train rather than the top. Um, so with that, there's, uh, we can introduce mitigations like um, parapet walls along the alignment that will also help um, mitigate any noise um, that would be foreseen by the, um, the alternative considered. Okay, uh, thank you, and Ned. Hey, Juan, did you wanna add anything else, or Peter, or? Yeah, I, I was, if you want me to speak a little bit about um, the drainage issues, I could, I could talk about that a little bit. We, um, we actually worked on a project in Menlo Park recently where we designed a tunnel, actually very similar in depth to, to this one. Um, the, the city of Menlo Park had a concern about drainage as well. So we designed a sump pump where uh, when the water level got to a certain point, um, it would trigger a switch and the electric, um, the, um, it would get triggered electrically to pump the water out um, into the drainage system near into the street, nearby street. And um, <clears throat> there was a concern, hey, what if there's a power outage? You know, the, the tunnel could, could flood. So we, we set it up and designed it so a, a generator could be set up um, next to the street. They could bring in a portable generator to pump, pump the water. Again, there's a, there's a lot of undercrossing similar to this one, the Homer. Like, I, like we mentioned before, the one at Mayfield at San Antonio Station as well. I, I'm not aware of any flooding issues at those. I, I, maybe we could talk to Caltrain about that and get back to council on that. But um, I, I don't really foresee the, the flooding being a, a major concern for the undercrossing. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, a lot of those questions that we had raised have been talked about or answered by uh, one of the folks. Uh, you heard from our city manager. Um, any um, action or direction for staff from council? Mr. Mayor? Uh, Councilmember Medina. Yeah, I just wanted to um, to ask when they do go back. I, I, I think the suggestion to move forward with two out of the eight options is, is a good idea and getting some more community input. And, and when we're obtaining that input, if we could schematically show what the difference, how much deeper, how much longer the, the, this new um, tunnel would be compared to the ones that are currently here in San Bruno, so that 
when you walk through the, the, the Euclid uh, undercrossing, you go, oh, okay, it's, it's 10 more feet longer or five feet deeper. So we, we understand the scale that this is because it's really hard to see um, with, with these renderings. And in, in, the, in the presentation, I don't think we covered or, or maybe I missed the, the picture showing how well lit these tunnels are. Um, I'm looking at um, the presentation of, I guess that's number 52 and slide 53, 52 and 53. Um, it shows very well that yeah. these, are pretty, these are pretty well lit. So uh, those are the kind of things I think would help our public understand just to be able to- yeah. Go Councilmember Davis. Davis. Councilmember Davis. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I. I totally agree, and I, I'm so thankful that Javon gave us that option to actually go forward with two, because I really would struggle here tonight to make a decision, but I would like to support one and five. Okay. Um, any other council member comments? Through the chair. Yeah, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, yeah, I think I like uh, what, what the city manager is suggesting. It still gives us two options. Uh, it, it narrows down what we're, um, you know, the, the whole uh, realm of, of possibilities, but still gives uh, an, one more opportunity for the public to comment whether they want to go over or under, but at least it, it narrows that down. So I'm, I'm okay with moving forward with that. Okay. Uh, nothing. What we, oh, one in five. I got it now. Okay, it took me a minute. Thanks. So I, I'm also comfortable with that as well. Uh, and uh, with what my other colleagues have said, um, is there any, anything else from any the electeds? Oh, is that a, uh, yes, uh, council member Mason. If we went with one in five, will that provide an opportunity for another, another kind of study session just to engage the public on a preference? I think the city manager was trying to get it scoped down to two out of the eight so that that could go back to and try to engage the community and seeing if they had input. Correct me, but, uh, city manager. I'm sorry, I just want to be clear. It's a separate meeting now. It's a separate meeting whether we, we are not going to vote, just really a discussion for the community. Similar to the one that was had back in, maybe it was November, right. when at American Legion. So, so uh, why don't I uh, provide a, a little clarity on that? So, council action to move forward uh, with one and five to the next phase of the project would mean that we would uh, partner with South City to seek funding for the next phase uh, of design work. Uh, we would be studying two options. Uh, they likely would be studying one. Uh, th their council meeting, I, I think, is a, a day or so after today, uh, where they will they'll make their, their 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 decision. And then that is a long process for us to apply for the funds, uh, be awarded the funds, and then that design work uh, to occur. Um, Haywan, uh, please op opine on how long that process will be. But while that process is going on, um, we can be designing our community outreach effort uh, that can have various components to it before we return to the city council. And so what we would want is for that some of that design work to occur uh, and then go out to the community uh, with some of that information to get more robust input. And that could be, hopefully we're way past COVID by then, uh, that could be in-person um, sessions, it could be surveys, uh, hang tags, et cetera. Uh, and then we would uh, likely come back to the city council with various meetings, likely a study session, uh, and then a, a, a action meeting to determine the final design. And so uh, there, there, there's plenty of time to design that outreach effort and, and have multiple injects. Uh, and I'm going to shut up because uh, Haywan knows more specifics on what that next phase will look like. I was going to say, it, that's, I, think, I just wanted to make sure there was going to be an opportunity for more engagement. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with one and five, given that there's going to be more opportunity to make yeah, a, a like final have, decision. Um, Melissa Reggiardo, uh, I think she can speak to the timeline a bit more, but um, I will say that we, if we were to proceed with um, alternative one and five, um, there is the next stage of this particular 
planning study. Uh, we this particular funding um, expires, I believe, in April, and so uh, we would largely want to be completed with the study by then. However, um, this next phase of this uh, study does allow for the development of the over and under crossings, so additional costs. Um, I believe those are at the 15% level, and uh, we can independently um, come back to council with information on, uh, you know, the 15% designs and the costs and additional renderings um, that the council could uh, view, and then also we take that to um, the community as well. Um, I'm not sure that the project necessarily has the funding to do that additional level. I think that might be something um, Ms. Rodrigo might be able to uh, discuss and as well as timing. This is Melissa Reggiardo from Caltrain. Thank you, Haywan. I really do agree with everything you've just said, but just to provide a little bit more detail, um, what we'll do based on your decision tonight is that we'd move ahead with the project study report incorporating um, alternatives one and five from the rail configuration perspective assuming that South City also makes it to that decision point. Um, and then we would study both the over and under crossing at the conceptual level of planning. So during that process, we would add more detail to the designs and potentially produce additional renderings. And AECOM, uh, Millette and Peter can also weigh in here um, in terms of more detail on that work. Um, but then you can use it to basically do community outreach while we're preparing that project study report. And ideally, we'd be able to finish it up around the April timeframe, which is when that TA funding expires. If we need to go a little bit beyond, we can seek an extension of that agreement. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps provide what the next few months would look like. And I don't know if Millette and Peter want to add some detail to that. Is there anything else to add or are we? No, I, I, this is Millette. I think that it, that is fine. I mean, we would have, um, I think it is correct that it's currently not in our scope to do um, additional outreach, but um, we certainly do have additional design work to do related to the PSR, but we would also be doing cost estimates as well as the renderings, um, which would um, have more information that you could provide to the community. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, city manager, um, staff, do we have direction at hey, one, one and five? Okay. So with that said, uh, we'll just continue on conduct of business and go to, and thank you uh, for everybody uh, being here uh, for the dialogue. Uh, item B, please, city clerk. Item 6B, wave first reading, introduce the 2019 fire and building code ordinances to be adopted by reference, schedule public hearing for adoption and adopt resolution approving findings of necessity and need for amendments, deletions and additions to the San Bruno Municipal Code. Director Smith. Hi, good evening, I'm back. Good evening again, honorable mayor and council members. So hold on, let me get the PowerPoint ready. Um, I'll be making the presentation tonight, even though this also includes the fire code the chief Ari DeLay has been kind of busy fighting real fires, so I get to make the presentation. Um, so the agenda for my presentation will start with the definition or the objective of this item, and then I'll provide the background and a more detailed overview of the ordinances and the resolution. And I'll highlight the action before council tonight, and we can end with questions. So the objective for this item is to waive the first reading and introduce the 2019 Fire and Building Code ordinances that would be adopted by reference, schedule a public hearing for adoption, which would be the next regular city council meeting, and adopt the resolution approving findings of necessity and need for the amendments, deletions, and additions to the San Bruno Municipal Code. And while I get to make this Presentation, I want to emphasize that a large number of city staff work collaboratively as part of a special projects team to develop the staff report and the 47 pages of ordinances and the resolution. 
And if there's technical questions about the codes tonight, then they might be best answered by Rory Bernald, our chief building official who's been waiting patiently in the wings, and Gage Slice, fire marshal, who'd like to come back and speak some more before you if you have any technical questions. And we also have assistance from Mark Saffron, the city attorney, as needed. And again, since this was such a large item, we also had assistance with the report preparation by members of our planning staff. So I'll cover some relevant background now only because I know you're probably wondering what are these building and fire codes. So the state of California Building Standards Commission, which is a pretty strong and robust commission, adopts these state building codes and that also includes the fire code. They do those every three years generally and this comprises what's legally called Title 24 of the California Code of Regulations. And sometimes the commission adopts mid-cycle adjustments, but I think when you see the code, you'll understand why they typically do these every three years. So what, what are these codes? They set design and construction standards for new construction, as well as new occupancy. So that's when a building changes the type of use throughout the entire state. They address requirements for structural, plumbing, electrical, and mechanical systems and for fire and life safety. But they've also expanded, and I'll touch on some of those items later, around energy conservation, green or sustainable design, and accessibility, ADA access in and around buildings. Commonly, these are referred to as the 2019 California Building Codes, but again, they encompass the fire codes, and they're automatically going to affect January 1st. And as I'll go into more detail later, cities may adopt local amendments that are more restrictive as reasonably necessary because of local climatic, geological, or topographical conditions. And we certainly have those in San Bruno. We have very interesting microclimates with a lot of wind and fog. We have geological conditions. We're right near um, San Andreas Fault. Or we have properties in a fault zone, a special fault zone determined by the state. And we have a lot of very topographical conditions. We are absolutely not flat. And so when when we look at these state codes, we sometimes need to modify them to suit our local needs and the state allows us to do that. So what are these codes? I just wanna pause for a minute and you probably think, well, why can't we just do these locally? Well, these are very voluminous codes. They are shown here. They take, you know, they take up more than one entire cabinet sometimes. And if you walk around the building division ever, you'll see them floating around. Um, they would, might put you to sleep at this hour but they're ginormous. And for example, our local municipal code, if you've ever seen a printed copy such as around City Hall, usually it's two volumes, double-sided. So this here is 11 binders. And I just wanted to emphasize, this is why they're done at a state level and adopted locally. Because locally, I, we would not want to uh, prepare all 11 binders um, and maintain them. And if any, any of you are really curious to see these ever, because um, they, they can be interesting to read. We have copies in the building division, but you can also now read them online. Um, and this is a terribly formatted slide, so please don't, it's not meant to be read, but I just wanna emphasize, this is the breadth and volume of what these codes include. And I mentioned that some of the topics, but there's also other topics this addresses, like historical codes and other really detailed aspects. And again, all of these parts are contained in those big voluminous binders. This is just another example of, well, what is that code? What is that code? It's really a legally complex document. It's written by very experienced and highly trained engineers, architects, attorneys, other building fire code experts, again, at the state level. And they really are the best of the best. And I would say in California, we are really at the forefront a lot around a lot of issues around, especially energy conservation and, um, fire safety and building safety and also seismic safety. So these are, are honestly some of the most state-of-the-art building codes in the entire world. That's why they're so voluminous and so technically detailed. But again, if you if you just read a little bit of it, it's, it's a very complex legal code. So what really changed? Well, again, we can always get better when we write these codes. And while some of it was code language restatements, minor refinements, such as we do with our local codes, if we find they aren't quite working right, just as we talk about with the short-term residential rental ordinance, um, some changes really in the state are leading the charge for photovoltaic systems, um, energy conservation, 
uh, which as we noticed recently with the rolling power outages, the state doesn't always have the energy supply to meet demand. And that's true. And new construction, building construction um, is a huge um, source of demand for energy. And so the state really sets extremely aggressive requirements around energy utilization for new construction. Um, also, the state is promoting other sustainable items such as electric vehicle chargers that you see here. So other changes, again, around increasing door and window performance. Performance means sort of, you know, that ability of the door and window to ensure there's no leakage of air quality. And if, if anyone sort of pits their doors and windows to the test around the latest issue around smoke, you realize you can have all your doors and windows shut and somehow the smoke still gets in and this defined me, but the latest requirements around performance really ensure that those windows and doors are airtight, um, but that's an energy feature uh, and then demand response controls, again, energy efficiency um, to manage mechanical lighting systems, which you see here. Um, other things that we've really evolved around are building safety. Um, un unfortunately, in this era, uh, educational occupancies, such as schools, need the ability to lock doors to keep out intruders. And that's actually in the building code. So again, it doesn't just encompass sort of basic building stuff. It really addresses building safety. And last, the new codes have expanded requirements for wildland urban interfaces, which again are very timely. So what do we do at the local level? Well, we're required by law to enforce these codes. They apply no matter what. Um, and all San Bruno projects requiring building permits submitted on or after January 1st of this year required to comply with them. Uh, so they've been applied successfully since that time with no major issues, again, our staff um, have reached out to the community, updated the website, our staff's attended a, a lot of training, um, and, and usually these codes sort of, again, because they're at the state level, our local architects, our local designers, local contractors are aware of them and trained, um, and that's a good thing. So we've been applying them successfully with not a lot of issues to date. So I'll cover the resolution and ordinances that are before you tonight. So again, the ordinances before you amend our local code, which is Title 11. That title is called Building Constructions and Fire Protection. Protection, and that's exactly what it did. Does um, it relates to buildings and fire protection? But what I want to pause here and emphasize is that you're not wiping out that entire title. There's other chapters in there, such as the floodplain ordinance, which you adopted last year, that remain as is. This literally just deals with how what codes we apply when we issue permits and the fire provisions um, and includes these local amendments. But I just want to emphasize you're only editing certain chapters and that's reflected in each of those ordinances that are before you tonight. And another key thing that we accomplished through this local adoption is ease of local implementation and the ability of the city to enforce the methods and processes contained within the municipal code. You are aware of some of those, you know, the appeals process, the ability of the city to issue citations and otherwise take um, code violations through municipal pro process. Those are kept in place um, and very important to the city. So we do have local amendments before you tonight and that's sort of what I wanted to spend the bulk of the time on because the state codes are the state codes and they're in effect. And all we need to do, if you looked at the ordinances, is literally change 2016 to 2019. So that's very simple. Um, it's unfortunate that we have to do that because um, there's a lot of work, but we do. But I just want to pause on the local amendments because we do have, as I mentioned previously, local climatic, geographical, and topographical conditions. That's pretty obvious here. Um, and in 2016, the City Council approved a number of local amendments and we are merely proposing those for readoption tonight um, with a, one minor change I want to touch on. But those local amendments I want to emphasize are what are in line with what other jurisdictions in the county have adopted. So our building official, Roy Bernald, speaks to other building officials at the entire county, our fire marshal, Gage Schleitz, talks to other fire marshals and fire districts, and it's all coordinated. And that really helps local contractors and design professionals to have that consistency. Um, so we aren't doing anything dramatically different. And I'll step through an example of that. So these tiny little diamond signs that are colored 
seen them many times thought, hmm, wonder what those are. Well, they're actually very important. They identify hazardous materials and they're really helpful if our emergency responders ever go out because of a fire or a leak or whatnot. Um, because frankly, our emergency responders could be at risk if they uh, apply water to these things or different um, have different um, strategies for handling them. So the state code conveniently doesn't set a specific sign requirements. They said, well, let the city decide. And our fire marshal, rather than answering the phone all day long, um, answering questions, he'd rather just set a requirement in the code. And that's again, what other fire marshals have done locally. This doesn't ca cause a, a, an unreasonable hardship. These little signs are about 12 or $30 readily available, but it just ensures that we have signs of a reasonable size, it's 15 inches by 15 inches to assist our emergency responders to do their job. And, and if we didn't set the 15 by 15 inches, it would be up to us to decide um, case by case basis, and then it just could cause some issues. So another example of a local amendment, which we already have in place is around address illumination. So why would that be important here? Well, we have fog and we also have steep streets. So what our local code requires is exactly what you see here. It's that we require new construction with address signs to have illuminated address numbers and more importantly to receive their primary powering from building wiring. And what that means is you don't just put a little battery pack in there and oh my gosh, the batteries go bad. And guess what? The illumination doesn't work. And then you have an emergency and the first responders come out and they can't find your address. And if the fog's heavy and you're on a slope, could cause a delay in emergency response. And that's a, an example of why kind of locally we may need a different standard than, you know, somewhere else that has no fog and is 100% flat and, you know, you could see very clearly. So that's an example of why, again, through very deliberate analysis, beginning you know, years ago, we set some local amendments in place. And again, these are in line with sort of other communities that have fog, that have steep slopes. Um, other things that we do unique in San Bruno, uh, but other jurisdictions near us do, are to ensure the protection of residential structures from airport, airport noise impacts through specifications for, you know, windows. Um, and then locally to ensure that we have the specifications related to the building officials role to administer the codes. Um, related to appeals and other penalties, which again are cross-referenced in our municipal code, chapter 1.28. And then fire, we have, as we've seen, um, high wind fire risk here. So again, starting back in 2016, the city set different requirements um, for construction because of our fire risk. And I wanna emphasize, you know, we put these in place and applied them many, for many years and our response from um, the building community is that these don't cause an unreasonable financial hardship to property owners or developers. And in fact, in looking at what other cities have done, there are cities on the pencil that have pages and pages and pages of local amendments that, that could in fact cause that. Um, and I think we've, we've taken a very um, moderate and reasonable stance here um, tonight. So the last item before you, in addition to those, those long ordinances, is a resolution, which is a very special finding of need resolution that needs to be filed with the state in order for those local amendments to be effective. And again, we've just documented the unique conditions here in San Bruno that we think warrant these. Uh, and in conclusion, the action before you tonight is to introduce the 2019 Fire and Building Code ordinances to be adopted by reference, schedule the public hearing for adoption, which is the next regular meeting if these move forward and adopt the resolution approving the findings of necessity and need for the amendments, deletions, and additions to the San Bernardino Municipal Code. And if you take this recommended action tonight, as I mentioned, the public hearing would be scheduled. That's a requirement because these are codes adopted by reference. The ordinances would be effective 30 days after adoption and we would then file those with the state. So that concludes my staff report. I'm happy to answer any questions along with our building official, fire marshal, and fire chief who are here tonight to assist in this item. Okay, uh, any questions from colleagues? None, okay, thank you. No, I'm seeing no. 
And uh, so I'm seeing none at this time. Okay, with that said, um, what I would need is to, uh, if the action from council, and do we have anybody from, I'm seeing nobody from the community. So let me check. No, okay. So I would need a motion and a second to waive the first reading. Make a motion to waive the first reading. Second. A uh, motion made and seconded to waive the first reading. Uh, roll call, please. Or Council wait, I, can, can I just do a, do we have to have a roll call or can we just do a motion? No, you can, you can do a voice vote if you would like. Sure. Um, okay, folks, on waiving the first reading. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm hearing 5-0 voice to waive the first reading. My understanding is we can take all of these at once. So uh, with permission, if I'll read this and uh, hopefully this will expedite it. Um, one motion will introduce all the ordinances, okay, since there are no changes. We're gonna schedule, so uh, we're gonna introduce all the ordinances and we're gonna uh, schedule a public hearing for adoption on 9-8-2020 and adopt the resolution approving the findings and necessity. Do I have a motion and a second? Motion to approve. Second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Davis? Aye. Councilmember Mason? Aye. Councilmember Medina? Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, now we can go on to item C under conduct, please. Item 6C. Adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a construction contract with International Waterproofing, Roofing, and Building Restoration, a division of Aetna International, Inc., for the Tom Lara concession slash grandstand rehabilitation project in an amount not to exceed $173,930, approving a construction contingency of $25,000 and appropriating $25,000 from the Park in Lieu Fund. Okay, and um, who's taking lead? Is it Director Tan or is it somebody else? It's Audrey Jones Taylor. Uh, Ms. Jones, please. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Dina and Honorable Council Members. My name is Audrey V. Jones Taylor, and I have the pleasure of serving as a strategic advisor for the Community Services Department and for your beautiful, beautiful city. What you have before you tonight is the rehabilitation of the grandstand facility at the Tom Lar Field. And Tim Wallace is supporting me in this presentation this evening. The agenda includes the objective, the background on the project, the project existing condition, the scope of work and project timeline, project costs, request to the city or request of the city council and next steps and questions. The objective is to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a construction contract with International Waterproofing, Roofing, and Building Restoration, a division of Aetna International Incorporated, for the Tom Lar Concession Grandstand Rehabil Rehabilitation Project in an amount not to exceed $173,930 and approving construction contingency of 25,000 and appropriating 25,000 from the park and lieu fund. The background on the project, the city was approached by the Lions Club back in 2019. And once they went inside the facility, they realized that there was additional work that needed to be done in order to protect the investment. And so the um, city manager went before the county and asked for $150,000 of Measure K funding in 2019 and council approved the funding. There were three contractors that responded to our request and staff reviewed the submittals. And upon reviewing the submittals, staff came to the conclusion that the international waterproofing res um, responded with the lowest bid and it was determined that the international waterproofing and building restoration, a division of Aetna, 
International should be awarded the contract. The scope of work includes the demolition and removal of existing bleachers, repairs and waterproofing of the roof, concrete sidewalls, other facility to eliminate any water intrusion. They also will be replacing the doors and all of the windows, and they will be replacing and installing new bleachers and um, putting a final finish painting on the final finishes. The construction is to begin, if all goes well tonight, on September the 1st with the completion of mid-November. The project costs, we can scoot that over a little bit. <laughs> the project cost is about 36,000. It's getting cut off. <laughs> 36,500 and something. <laughs> Bleachers and demolition is 55. Window replacements is 28,95. Door replacements is about 15,400. Um, Exterior painting grandstand is 37. And the subtotal is 173.930. And we are asking for the park and loop fund for contingency of 25,000, bringing the total cost to 198.930, I believe. The request to city council and the next steps is to adopt the resolution authorizing the city manager to execute the construction contract with the International Waterproofing, Roofing and Building Restoration, a division of Aetna International Inc. for the Tom Lahr concession slash grandstand rehabilitation project in the amount not to exceed $173,930. Approving the construction contingency of 25000 and appropriating 25000 from the Park and Loop Fund. I am available for questions. Questions from colleagues? To the chair. Uh, Council Member Davis. It's easier than raising my hand. <laughs> um, so what won't be um, on, I mean, the grandstand, it's the bleachers, it's the snack bar. Is anything in the snack bar getting redone? Or is it just for all the grandstands and the outer um, painting of the backside of it too, and the windows on the backside and the door on the backside? What's yes, not being so, replaced? So this particular agreement and funding request just covers the exterior. There's an additional $25,000 that the Lions Club has funds for to be able to do the interior. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. To the mayor. Uh, Councilmember Mason. What's the likelihood of that $25,000 contingency being expended? That is a good question, but it's also an unknown question because just as when they went in to begin the work interior, they found a lot of problems. The building is old, you know, so we're not really sure what we're going to run into, but hopefully we will not have to expend that much if if any, but it's really unknown at this particular point. Thank you. Anything from the vice mayor or council member Medina? No, no, council member Medina. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, but well, I am in favor of this project. I am a San Bruno lion, um, proud to be. And I wanted to also uh, thank the mayor for the efforts and getting our supervisors to um, pitch in the money to get this done and and it's another example of, of our city the condition of it, it it's like you, you start getting into wanting to fix something and you find out you have to fix something else and, and uh construction costs are, are very expensive so um but as for my i guess as for the question that i have for tonight is is the painting scheme um, are we that far along that we, we kind of know what we're going to do there? Are we going to, what's, what's, what's it going to look like when we're, when we, when we walk away? It's going to look beautiful, but in terms of the color scheme, I don't know. That is a good question. I have okay. not really had the conversation about the color scheme. Is there a particular color that you're looking for? No, no, I'm just, I'm just curious to see how far along the way it's going and, and, um, 
Um, I, I, I know it's late and I just wanted to go ahead and express my support and thanks for everybody who worked on this. I know this took a long time, but I think it's going to be a worthwhile effort. We get this done and uh, can't wait to play baseball again. So uh, uh, thank, thank you, everybody. And uh, my only comments would be thank you to everybody as well. Uh, all right. If there are no more questions, then we would have, uh, can we have a motion and a second to, to uh, adopt the resolution, please? Motion to adopt the resolution. Approve. Second. Okay. Uh, Medina Davis, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Davis. Aye. Councilmember Mason. Aye. Councilmember Medina. Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar. Aye. Mayor Medina. Aye. Motion now, carries. Mo Thank you. I'm sorry. Now we'll move on to uh, item number seven, comments from council members. First one, uh, uh, two items for myself, uh, recognize the San Bruno community for its resiliency during these difficult times, including those that volunteer and contribute to our community by demonstrating human kindness. Uh, council member Mason is gonna have one, so I won't touch on that. That's kind of what helped precipitate that. You know, these have been some challenging times and there are folks that, uh, there are many that do a lot of things that uh, we do not know and uh, not um, maybe wishing to be acknowledged, but you know, I, I wanna generally thank, there are folks that have been volunteering at the COVID-19 uh, test sites, both here and in other communities. There are those that volunteer at the Second Harvest Food Giveaway, which happens at Bel Air. But also, um, I, wanna, on that, I also wanna thank the chancellor for the community college district. Um, got, got had a uh, for the second harvest for a large food, food distribution. They were trying to get something more North County, and um, uh, one of the other community colleges basically was doing it. And Skyline said no. So I, I made a call to the chancellor and checked. And um, thanks to him and the staff at Skyline College, they will be doing a food distribution at Skyline College uh, beginning of next week. Um, they're telling me they don't need advertising. They want to get themselves uh, in a sink, and uh, they already have plenty. Um, but I did want to thank him uh, for making that happen. They're also, uh, you know, I was informed by Leslie, too. We've had many uh, folks that have called, volunteered, that are doing errands and yards for seniors who are running their errands. Um, and many that we don't even know that are doing that, but uh, those are some of the individual connections Leslie's been doing through the Community Foundation. You know, it was also interesting being at the city park. They had the ice cream uh, truck that was there, and no, I didn't have any ice cream as behaving, but there was a gentleman that went up, uh, paid for his group, threw down $100 and said, pay for as many as you can behind me. Sweet. And that is the kind of stuff that... Uh, I wanted to acknowledge and bring up uh, not a lot of names, but I think there's a lot of folks that uh, are not even mentioned here that do a lot. So uh, those are the kind of things that uh, even in challenging times, people step forward, uh, people continue to uh, show their care and kindness and show the city with heart. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. On second bullet point, discuss having a drive-in uh, theater night in San Bruno. So I just wanted to see if this is something that the council may want to embark upon or at least look into more. I want to set up expectations that it's, not, that it's a definite. Uh, there's costs, there's arrangements. Uh, I have up to the mall and San Fran, they're, they're open to the idea of doing it outside. Obviously they have some open space at this time. Um, I have spoken to somebody in the community of business who would be willing to be a sponsor. Um, I have spoke to the city of Burlingame who had one at the golf center just to get some of the facts and figures, how they did it, what the kind of costs were. So this is far from <clears throat> could it be, but I didn't want to just us plate things up to staff without doing a little bit of homework, see if it's viable. Um, and again, it takes logistics and working together, but at least there is willingness on some people's parts uh, to have that. Um, things could change and we could be off the watch list and maybe that, that modifies things. But uh, Burlingame did do one. Um, they, they did the movie Hook. They recommend a movie not so long, but uh, because of the lateness of when you start, but they are going to do another one because the um, turnout, they sold out like a day and a half uh, for tickets for the vehicles. So uh, anyway, that is something I did know whether uh, council would like to see some more effort put in and see if it's something that can be worked out and 
keeping in mind staff's time, keeping in mind costs. And that's it for my two bullet points. Thank you, Martin. So I don't know if we're, are we having a discussion, I guess? So I, I got a thumbs up from Marty, so I got that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great idea. Lord I mean, we, we, we talked about it a couple of months ago at one of our one-on-ones. So I think it's at that time, I don't think that they were ready, but I think it's a great idea. We attended the San Mateo County Fair one. Hmm. I thought it was a little costly, to be honest. It was like 30, 35 or $37 per car. Um, but a percentage of it went to San Mateo County Strong, mm -hmm. and my kids had never been to a drive-in, and they absolutely loved it. So I think it would be great. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, it was just uh, they said all all ages, so it was kind of they mm -hmm. they said it was it was fun to see. One important um, question: Did you make yeah. sure you turn your car on every so long, often so you don't get yes. a dead battery? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. But it's not like the old days where they put speakers in your car. You have to tune in to a certain yes. station. And that costs money. So, yeah. but yes, I was trying to figure that part out too. I got educated. So, yeah. um, okay. We'll uh, take that from there. And then uh, let's move on to uh, item B, uh, council member limit, Linda Mason. First item. Oh, yeah. Coffee. So I did. I actually did want to ask if there was um, going to be uh, if there's going to be discussion if there's public comment. But because um, I know that there's someone on the phone that's going to speak that one that wanted to make a comment on this. But um, this has been, I know, a, a bit of a controversial issue because we're concerned about people's health. Um, I do really want to encourage us to try this outdoor dining. I'm personally, I'm, I'm actually not set on any specific times. We, you know, 11 to 3 was what we came up with on a Saturday. Um, I feel pretty strongly that either we're going to do it now or we're not going to do it because this is really our warm season, uh, September, and so usually it's about um, Columbus Day weekend. And after that, I think that our window is really just closed because it gets windy and, and it starts getting really cold. So um, I did talk to some of the retail shops and the retail shops were open to trying this because it's one of the impacts that I've heard other cities have had is retail has been hurt if there's been closures. Um, but it depends on how long they've been closed. And I think some of these streets have been closed all weekend as opposed to just a couple of hours. So um, I think we should try it. I mean, if it doesn't work, we don't have to continue it. But I think the weather right now is inviting. And from what I'm seeing, at least, seeing JC Bruno the, um, and what they've done with their patio, seeing Mighty Mud, what they've done outside, West Coast Cafe, um, I think it's an opportunity to just bring people down to give our small shops some business. Um, and as long as people social distance and wear their masks, um, you know, all of the studies that we're seeing show that that's the most effective way to prevent coronavirus. So um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, yes, there is somebody um, uh, wishing to speak, John, and because uh, I believe it's going to be on this topic because it just the hand came up. So, uh, Melissa, could we let that? Can we let John in, please? Yes, John Kavrani, and I've just brought you in the room. I'm trying to get you unmuted. Hi, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, whenever you're ready. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. My name is John Kavranian. I've been a resident of San Bruno for 27 years. I'm speaking tonight in support of road closure for outdoor dining on San Mateo Avenue. I'm a small business owner in Burlingame on Broadway. And also, I am the president of the Broadway Business District. I have helped organize outdoor dining for the Broadway, which started about five, year, uh, five weeks ago. It's been a very successful event, and I encourage you to support San Mateo Avenue road closure. Restaurants who have received PPP funding are almost depleting their funds. We may receive a few complaints from retailers in regards to the road closure, but restaurants are struggling and they're having a rough time. Retailers are able to have their doors open seven days a week and are doing regular business. And also our local Burlingame Broadway downtown road closure, especially on Saturdays, that one day outdoor dining is creating one week's worth of sales for our restaurant. Usually they have four or five tables on the sidewalks 
but with the outdoor dining road closure, they're using 15, 20, 25 tables. They received permissions from their neighbors to allow them to have tables also, and it's been very beneficial. The rainy season is coming, and this is the opportunity for our restaurants to maximize what they can before the rainy season, because when the season comes, and if you can't have indoor or outdoor, it's a big struggle. I encourage the council to work with the downtown and have this road closure for the benefit of the businesses and the community. And if you have any questions, I'm able to answer questions for you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Tim O'Brien. Hi, okay. actually, it's Raina. Hi, Raina. Hi. I actually am a hundred percent in agreement with the with John and with Linda. I think that we gotta do whatever it takes for all the restaurants to um, in San Bruno Avenue to basically um, survive during this uh, time and the way some um berlin game is doing it the way the way uh redwood city is doing it also so yeah i think it'll be a great idea to basically have the street uh the closure of that street so to generate more people walking and dine outside so i totally for it and i hope you approve that thank you Thank you, seeing no other hands, and we'll bring it uh, back to, to Linda and, and uh, Council. I'm sorry, what, what is, uh, I, I mean, I'm definitely in support of this, obviously, but um, I don't know if Council oh. wants to jump in. <laughs> yes, and I'm sorry, I had to switch over from attendees to panelists. So, sorry, Mark. Uh, <laughs> Council Member uh, Medina. Yeah. Um, I'm in support of the concept. Um, we our our restaurants need the help. Um, some outreach was conducted with um, with some help with uh, at the time. Karen Cunningham was the ambassador to the chamber, and and there wasn't too much interest. But uh, if if we try this, and maybe it'll it'll spur uh, the interest a little bit more. Um, for, for me, I generally just pick up the food to go. Uh, I went JC Bruno on Tuesday with the Rotary, uh, spotlight that restaurant ordered to go today, went to Akagi ordered to go, um, probably put on 12 pounds, but that's okay. Um, so are we going to have staff look into what section of the, of San Mateo Avenue they're going to close? Um, there's more restaurants that are located on the north end. Um, so I, 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 I'm in support of the concept. I just want to make sure that it's implemented properly and that we're not closing the whole street when there's not going to be any restaurants participating on a certain large section. Primarily that would be on the south end. Um, but, uh, open up maybe part of the parking lot. I, I, I thought I heard uh, JC Bruno is going to be kind of extending into that little breezeway area. So um, I, I, it's four hours a day. Maybe we can get some volunteers to help put out uh, uh, to reduce staff costs. Um, but uh, I, I can support this. I just want to make sure that it's going to be thought through a little bit more and how much um, of the retailers, do we have a sense that some of them are really objecting to it? Um, and and how many restaurants are actually going to participate? So um, we have a few days before the, I guess, till next week to figure out if we're going to start this. But I think the hours are right. It does get pretty windy in the in the afternoons, and 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 we give it a shot. So. I can, I can support this. I just want to make sure that, that, uh, 
uh, we're going to get the participation and um, we don't have a closed street and there's nobody really putting tables out on the street and it's what what's the point Yeah, was it, and then that that was uh, something I wanted to ask too. Are we talking the whole San Mateo Avenue? Are we talking certain blocks? I mean, because really, I, I don't know what would what would we be asking staff to kind of look into. That's. Is there I think more? we leave it. I, I actually don't know that we have a lot of time. I think that we leave it up to staff to separate. However, um, to say, let's say the month of September, every Saturday in September might be a different block or a different two blocks. Um, I will say that um, Broadway is all closed, and um, I know um, that they don't have as many restaurants as one would think either, but because they've spread out into some of the retail areas, it actually appears like it's more restaurants than, than it is. Um, but I trust staff to honestly make that decision and to start marketing right away to the restaurants to say this is the weekend that your particular block will be closed. Um, please feel free to, you know, start planning and preparing for it. I don't know that we have a lot of time to be going back and forth um, with staff. Yeah, well, with that, though, you know, I, I did talk to uh, from San Carlos and Burlingame just to let just to kind of get their perspective. And plus what I heard read in the Daily Journal. So just like with the driving or something, it, it depends on staff and it depends on cost. Uh, and do we have those funds? So, I mean, I know in Burlingame, they have a, they're, the, they're losing money because of the meters. So when they do that, so there is a direct effect to them. Um, and they did do a survey. I was looking at their staff report from this month that had retailers not as happy for obvious reasons, the parking element, trying to get to things. Um, then there was the social distancing, according to what I heard in Burlingame, why on Broadway, I'm sorry, on Burlingame, not Broadway. Um, there was more of a of a concern. It became more of a of a festive type atmosphere, and was was hard to regulate as far as keeping um, the importance during COVID. So that's what I'm thinking. You know, we need to kind of. I'm trying to figure out how to help staff quantify more because I don't know. Let me tell you, I, I threw out like, oh, what about September 18 for drive? And I already had staff saying, or city manager specifically, like. I don't know if that's enough time. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of why I, I, I just share some of the, the concerns that we're gonna get. So um, other uh, thoughts or comments from other two colleagues? Uh, um, uh, uh, Council Member David, sure, you, you muted yourself to talk. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Huh. Um, I, you know, I appreciate the, the consideration and I, and I think that we're all in the same thing is that we want to be able to make decisions and recommendations to help every business in San Bruno, whether you're on San Mateo Avenue or you're on San Bruno Avenue or El Camino, et cetera. My concern is, and I've asked this question a number of times, and I haven't heard staff say, gee, there's an outpouring of requests to really open our street and business after business want to do this. Um, and I think I asked the question earlier, I mean, I would say you start with the first step, and the first step is you allow them to venture onto their sidewalk. West Coast Cafe has done a great little job with that. You ask them if they're interested in, in doing a bulb out, and they take up a parking spot or two. Um, and, and, and then if there's not enough and you get enough businesses that are recommending, you can go from there based on the demand, but I'm just not hearing that. So I'm concerned with the same problem that Burlingame has. So for me personally, I won't go there. Um, I'm not wanting to get out in the public because it's really actually bad. I, I had dinner one night in downtown Burlingame and it's just a lot of people and I don't feel like we're social distancing. Um, and so I get where Burlingame's now saying, we're, nope, we're opening it up. We're no longer doing this. This has created a festival like atmosphere. So I'm concerned that that's going to be the same thing, that we're not actually creating social distancing. Um, so for me, when the streets close, I don't prefer to go there, and I prefer to pick up and get food to go. So you're going to take away that portion of the business. So again, I just think that I, I leave it to staff, and I really want staff to be supportive and come to us and say, council, we're getting requests. We feel like this is a good opportunity for us to do X, Y, Z, and here's what we recommend. In addition, um, it's, it's, a, it's a time constraint because 
um, in Burlingame, for example, every street leading to the closed streets have a, uh, a barricade with a sign that says street closed ahead, giving people driving into the community an, an, an update. Hey, you're, you're going to come down a street that's going to be closed. You can't make a right turn on that next street. You can only go through. So there's an extra burden on staff when we're limited on staff. So I think we really need to pick and choose our battles and, and make sure they're the right ones and make sure that we're not just creating something that's not needed. So until I can hear from staff that this is really a need and we're getting restaurants who are asking for this, um, I'd, re I'd rather restaurants reach out to staff and figure out the best plan for each individual restaurant and see what makes, makes sense. Vice Mayor? Um, yeah, you know, I I really like the idea of trying to get creative around how we help the businesses uh, in San Bruno. And, uh, you know, it, it sounds like there's there's been experiments and, and you know, there's there's some data out there. But I, I think Council Member Davis's concerns around just logistics, I, mean, I, I definitely want to hear from staff on um, you know, how doable some of this is in terms of do we have the staffing available to um, open and close? I, I imagine the barricades would have to be manned in case there's uh, some kind of a, an emergency where people may, uh, you know, a, a fire department or police need to get in there. Uh, somebody would have to be able to, or I guess the police could move the barricade when they got there. But um, and then uh, also, I think I think uh, San Mateo Avenue has an active bus route on the weekend. So um, is that would we have to coordinate with Samtrans on um, rerouting buses uh, to get around there? And I, you know, I'm not sure how uh, um, how that would work. Uh, but uh, also a, a consideration if we're talking about closing it. So. Um, I, I think I like the idea of, um, you know, blocking off some parking spots and just expanding the, the sidewalk area. Um, and maybe that's easier. I don't, I don't know. And maybe that's a, a challenge for, for staff as well. So um, I, I would definitely like to hear from the city manager in terms of, um, you know, is, is this something, I mean, are, are we, are, are we just, uh, you know, just way out of line in, in looking at this or is it, uh, is it something that's within the realm of, of something that we can do and, and do quickly before our um, our good weather evaporates? Randy and Summers. City Manager. Sure. Javon Grogan, City Manager. Um, I think it's important to sort of back up before we go forward and address all those concerns. Um, <clears throat> outdoor dining, uh, we all know it has been around for a while, but. Uh, relative to COVID-19, there are essentially three types of outdoor dining that cities have tilted up. And what we're essentially would be doing is developing uh, expedited rules uh, about allowing outdoor dining, some of which we've done. The component that we're talking about now, we, we have not done it. So there are really three types of outdoor dining. One is allowing people to use part of the sidewalk. Uh, we promulgated those regulations uh, almost six weeks ago uh, and have allowed people to do it and people are taking advantage of it. Two is allowing people to uh, take parking stalls, on-street stalls away and uh, set up tables in the parking strip. We will allow that. We have no restaurants that have taken us up on that offer. The third item is what we're talking about now which is either a uh, full or partial street closure uh, to vehicular traffic. Uh, and we have not, uh, from the staff level, stepped into that uh, for a, a number of reasons uh, that I'll articulate now. That doesn't mean that we can't go there at some time. Uh, initially, when we allowed uh, sidewalk dining and parklet dining, uh, should uh, businesses want to set it up? <laughs> We reached out to businesses in various formats through the chamber. Uh, our fire marshal is here. He was uh, one of the uh, our city employees that walked downtown on several days, uh, and we reached out. And what we initially heard was, we're not interested. Uh, some restaurants were uh, only doing takeout because, frankly, it had a lower cost of overhead. They could just do takeout, uh, and they were happy with that. Uh, and even when, during that time period where we uh, where there could be some indoor dining, 
we had some restaurants just saying, hey, I'm only doing takeout. It's easier for us, put up the plexiglass, order and leave. Uh, and then the situation became more, more prolonged. Uh, we uh, eventually got on the county monitoring list and we saw more and more people setting up uh, tables uh, on the sidewalk, even over the last two weeks. As you walk downtown, you see more and more people setting up uh, tables uh, on the sidewalk. Uh, and so we have continued to outreach to restaurants in various fashions. What we have not heard is a large outcry for uh, close the street. Um, um, and we have not went there because while there are some areas in the county that have done that, the success uh, is not consistent. Uh, as we know in Burlingame, uh, ratcheted back what they were doing on Burlingame Avenue. And there's, a, frankly, a significant safety concern uh, about creating a fair type atmosphere where you have people eating and drinking in close proximity, not wearing masks. Uh, and uh, while we know some restaurants may want it, uh, it does pose a, a safety concern. And, uh, and should the city council want to go that way, you know, staff will certainly do whatever we, we can uh, to facilitate it. Uh, but, but through the EOC, uh, we have not um, picked up that uh, and, um, and, and started uh, full street closures. Full street closures also pose other challenges uh, with uh, San Mateo Avenue. Uh, we need to keep a 20-foot uh, uh, lane available for fire access, and so we would have to have um, manned access points if we do the entire street. Um, as was mentioned, uh, that is multiple access points, and so we, we of course, would have to have those uh, staffed uh, with um, public safety personnel, um, other people um, on overtime, just because we're not set up to have that level of programming on the weekend. If we did a smaller segment, we would still have to have that. Um, we would have to have hard barricades uh, in some areas, but have removable bar barricades with people there that are able to remove them uh, should there be an emergency uh, and the need to access it. What I also want to say uh, to the city council, because it was mentioned that we should do this soon, and I think it even alluded to potentially uh, we have a few days as in doing it this weekend. I would caution the city council about rushing uh, into this fast. A, a significant outreach needs to be done to the community. While we may have restaurants happy, we may have other, other businesses uh, that suffer. We may have some restaurants that say, you know what, I, I don't want to take advantage of that. And by closing down the street in front of me, you've limited my ability for delivery services like DoorDash. Uh, and uh, the and and people to access to come and pick up deliveries and, and we know we have a lot of residents that or a lot of restaurants that, that rely on that service and so by closing the street in front of them depending on where they are what impact that will have on their business uh, because we want to help businesses but we also don't want to hurt them and there are also uh, non-restaurant businesses that may have a, um, a a thought on this and so what I would recommend to the city council is that if you're interested in this. Uh, we take a step back, uh, we plan it out, we do a detailed outreach to the businesses that will be affected and, and get input. Uh, and, and, you know, we talk a lot about community input and, and what does the community think. And uh, there may be things like rerouting a bus route if we decide to, to close down a street and, uh, that has an active bus route. And there's real work that goes into this. And so it's not as easy as saying, oh, let's print up some signs and have this done by Saturday. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of work and there may also be a cost. Uh, the, the other thing I want to mention is that we do not know the timing upon which we will um, hopefully come off of the, the statewide monitoring list and indoor uh, dining uh, be allowed again. And so what are our thoughts vis-a-vis -vis if that happens? Um, uh, what's the council's desire? And so. Uh, as your city manager, what I would recommend is that if the council uh, or majority of council wants to proceed in this fashion, you provide uh, staff with enough time to look into the matter and return to you with options, costs, uh, and a real plan. Uh, and we, we do some significant outreach to all of the affected businesses. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think we want to try and save our, re our, our restaurants and, and, and damage some of our other businesses that, that count on that foot traffic. Because part of what we're saying is that we want 
people to come to downtown, but we actually don't want too many people to come to downtown because that's unsafe right now. And so we need to really think about this and, and be um, uh, facilitated and, and planned about it versus uh, rushed uh, would, my rec would be my professional recommendation to you. And so should a majority of council want us to look into this, you know, we are, we are, we are happy to do so, do so, return to you with more data uh, and information uh, and robust input for our, from all of the stakeholders uh, along San Mateo Avenue uh, in whatever section we we, uh, uh, we or you identify uh, to be uh, potentially closed. The chair. Councilmember Davis. So I would definitely recommend that staff goes back and does sort of a robust investigation to determine whether really what the need is before we do anything and go from there. Councilmember Medina. <clears throat> yeah, I, I I figured that was uh, that's that's um, I think that's the the right way of doing it. We just can't close it immediately. And I and I didn't mean to imply we're going to do it this this weekend. Um, I was thinking maybe possibly the next, but um, I I see the benefit of of getting more input um, and dealing with potential problems and and hopefully uh, we have enough interest. Because I I noticed that more more restaurants are kind of putting up the sidewalk uh, uh, seating, so um, I'm, I'm in favor of the, uh, the city manager's recommendation. Yeah, and I know in San Carlos, I think on Laurel they had three areas that they had blocked off, and then they opened up one because there was not the interest. So it was like, why are we blocking that that thoroughway when there wasn't the the, the restaurants. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I always worry about uh, the, the cost and staff. And let me tell you, let's, let's say we get off the watch list and the, the drive-in idea, you know, and let's say the cinema opens back up. I'm sure they're going to say that's, yeah, that's in competition. So that may, that may not occur or have to go to another location. So getting off the watch list may, may modify some things, but I, I, I would, you know, something Councilmember Medina said too, there are certain areas that you wouldn't really cordon it off. There's the one that he referenced, which is way north. That's one thing. There's a lot within an area. Um, and then there's some that, that probably wouldn't and some that may not financially be able to support bringing on staff um, who they maybe have laid off. That is just like, hey, come back for so many hours. Well, obviously, you know, if you have to get off unemployment to get back on for a shift, um, then that's not going to help them. I just, I think what needs to be known is more realistic of the, the actual costs. And, and you're right, I was trying to read through the Burlingame staff report, but there were costs. Staff time, they're setting up, there's closing it off, there's monitoring it, and then there's putting it away. Um, and so that that is important, I think. And then just the interest too. Um, Saida is one maybe we can, uh, Drought can be reached out to. Um, for seeing if she's had um, requests from the merchants that she's engaged with or that they they email or talk to or going through some of the requests for uh, assistance. That might be something to. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Councilmember Medina. Yeah, I, I wanted to, um, I, and I, I just don't know this, but to put a to put a table out in a parking space, I mean, it's is the safety involved with that do we need to have a, a, a real parking park, a parklet there with what's required for that? I don't know. If we were to say, let's let them take the parking spaces, well, how safe is that? And then who bears the responsibility? Somebody backs into somebody, you know, like just, but um, can, and that, I guess that's where the city manager can, can, what would it take to have a parklet? Is there, what, what's that process to offer that to the restaurants as like the first step and then closing the street would be like, if there was more interest for that. Sure, um, so the first question, if a restaurant wanted to take over parking spaces uh, in, in, in front of their location, what would be required? So our public safety and traffic engineer um, engineers have opined that it is a barricade that is capable of stopping a car. Uh, and it would likely be um, not just your metal barricades, but 
likely your bear cave that can be filled with water or sand. Uh, there's a cost there. There's a cost for the restaurant uh, for doing that, uh, and you can, you know, potentially uh, take one or two parking uh, spaces and with the sidewalk uh, strip and uh, what's left in the parking strip, get a few tables out there. Uh, there are also more semi-permanent structures that if a restaurant was willing to make that investment that we would uh, be willing to entertain for what you would more typically see in a parklet, which is something that is constructed out of wood, uh, but is designed uh, with certain elements that, that provide safety. I, I think personally the best example locally uh, is Fiddler's Green uh, in, in Millbrae, although that's on a, um, a street that's set in from El Camino Real. It's probably the best local example that I think our residents can think of of what a parklet dining facility could look like if it's more of a semi, semi-permanent semi structure. And again, with the uh, regulations that we promulgated through the EOC, uh, we are uh, willing uh, to support any businesses that would like to do that, uh, either the, uh, the barricade version or uh, something that is more uh, formally constructed. Councilor Mason. Yeah, I would just say that um, I feel like uh, we've once again heard all the reasons why we cannot do something um, when every other city uh, largely has already done it. And I want to just point out that while Burlingame Avenue has stepped back, Broadway has actually not stepped back, as was mentioned earlier, um, that the blocking off of the street has greatly, greatly helped their businesses. Um, and so I'm really disappointed um, to hear so many, uh, so much concern um, over something that so many other cities have actually successfully done um, and something that we're just going to wait and the boat's going to pass and hopefully more businesses don't close because when we first moved to San Bruno, a number of storefronts were empty um, and I've already seen two close. Um, I just heard that the flower shop is closing on San Bruno Avenue, I mean, on San Mateo Avenue, um, and another business has closed up in Bay Hill. And I just, I think that it's something that we should have already done. We haven't done it. We hesitated to do sidewalk dining. Sidewalk dining has started. It's popular. I almost think sidewalk dining in certain locations is actually more of a danger because you've got to walk through all the different tables because you can't walk on the street because it's not closed. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, if we're going to wait, I don't know that we're going to get anywhere at this point because we're already really realistically in September. So um, so I'm, I'm disappointed. I feel like we waited a long time for sidewalk dining. I, we learned about parklets, I think, this past week. Um, and, um, again, there's significant concern over something that other cities are doing successfully. So that's it. Thank you. To the chair. Um, uh, Council Member Davidson, uh, I don't know if the city manager said something. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, man, I, I don't know if that's a, uh, you know, speech speak running for mayor. I'm very offended by your comments because as a council, we look for the recommendation by staff. And staff is coming back to us saying, you know what, we're not hearing it. We're not seeing the recommendation. So one or two businesses that may have if talk to you about this, I'm not hearing it. And there's no facts in front of us to say that we want to put staff time. By the way, who's working on the weekends to set this up? Are we paying overtime for that? Or are we put, bringing people in that we've laid off or the people who haven't filled positions? We have to pick and choose our battles. We need to do these things appropriately and in the right time. And just jumping down because of what we want to do and everybody else is doing it, doesn't make it right for San Bruno or right for us. Let's let staff go and review the process, reach out to the businesses, and if, and if this is what we want them to come back, I'll have a special meeting next week. I'll have one on Friday if that's what we're hearing. But let's make sure we do the right thing first before we create a lot of work for people and it's not needed. It's not fair to the limited staff we already have on service and the budget is tight. So where's the money gonna come from? So I'm not sure if that if there's a response that's requested to that because the staff has gone down at San Mateo Avenue already I believe two or three times um, so there is some feedback 
Um, and my understanding also is that not all staff has spoken with owners. They've spoken with people who are working, not necessarily the owner of the business. So um, I know that there's costs associated with everything, but there's costs associated with losing business forever um, if they close. So. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Medina and, uh, I'm sorry, yes, please. Oh, if somebody else has their hands up, I mean, that's no, fine. I, no, I thought I had skipped over uh, city management. I don't think I did. Well, I think the city manager is open to having staff spend some time. I mean, maybe he could provide, you know, how much staff that would be, but to, to send send a couple people down again to see if if those uh, restaurant owners and um, I think I, I wouldn't have a problem you know telling the ones I know say hey you know it's a possibility um, let them know that you're interested right and then and then maybe we could figure out um, what we can do um, we I, I I don't think we j can just close it um, like definitely not this weekend, but I think the idea would be maybe to look at doing something by next week, next weekend, potentially. Is that, is that too uh, hopeful city manager for next weekend? Is that, that she's out of the question or is that Labor Day weekend? I forget. Uh, to the mayor, uh, in response to council member uh, Medina's question, uh, what I think the best course of action, given the council discussion, is for us to do a specific and dedicated outreach to all of the businesses uh, on a on San Mateo Avenue, and, and let's come back to that because I think we can narrow it down to a certain segment tonight that will make that outreach more more efficient, uh, given the comments that have been made. But we do a dedicated outreach to all of the businesses, not just the restaurants, uh, and get their feedback. Uh, and it is true that staff has walked it several times. Sometimes we talk to business owners, sometimes we talk uh, to, to the individuals that were there. The chamber also reached out through their contacts and their surveys and their people making individual calls. And it is true to this date, we have not had a, a significant um, um, uh, a significant number of restaurants saying, hey, we want to close down on the portion of San Mateo Avenue. I think in all honesty, we haven't really asked that question uh, very specifically and emphatically, hey, do you want an outdoor, uh, all the, the street closed, and here's what that would look like, what's the impact on your business? I think we can ask that question. You know, just to set the record straight, because it was said that we um, uh, were late to sidewalk dining, and we just heard about uh, parklet dining this week. Uh, to set the record straight, we were the first, the absolute first in the county to promulgate emergency sidewalk dining regulations uh, right after uh, they, 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 they were allowed, we were allowed to do so. We were the absolute first. Those came out, I believe, on a Friday, and we pushed them out. Those same regulations that were the first in the county also included the ability for uh, restaurants to do parklets. We have not had any restaurants say, I want to do a parklet. What I would tell you, I think that's largely because that involves cost. It involves cost, both staff time and, and equipment. And th there sort of have been this wave impact of, you uh restaurants were considered essential so they were open um but they could only do takeout and then they could do takeout plus indoor dining and uh when, when we were in that vein some restaurants were just okay takeout only and then some were saying hey you know the couple tables i have inside plus takeout i'm fine uh and then we hit we're on the state watch list where you can only do takeout and then we we saw what we see now which is almost every week more and more restaurants are setting out um, tables on the sidewalk, which again, we were the first in the county to allow. It's just people did not take advantage of that. Um, and I don't think, and, 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 I, and I know we had staff walk it, we had outreach through the Chamber of Commerce. I think, I think the honest answer is uh, this is new and foreign territory to all of us. And, and um, you know, people are making the decisions based on their unique circumstance um, and, and as the situation develops. But let nothing I said tonight uh, make anyone on the city council or the public feel that the uh, staff is not in favor of it. Uh, the only uh, recommendation uh, you've heard is, you know, if we're going to do it, let's step into it methodically. Uh, let's understand the cost. Let's understand what all of our stakeholders 
uh, want and desire. And with that said, I think what I've heard from the city council is all of San Mateo Avenue for this potential um, closure uh, has challenges. So looking at a segment of San Mateo Avenue is more um, um, appropriate. And then I've heard sort of that northern side has the um, uh, largest uh, area of restaurants that we think that, that I, I think I've heard sort of uh, this may be more appropriate for. And so what I guess what I would ask council is again, um, if we want to narrow it down, that would make the outreach sort of easier, right? And, and, and more tailored. Uh, and the other thing uh, that I, I did mention and we confirmed that there is a bus route that, that goes from Genevan North. Uh, and so, um, you know, work, work with Sam Trans uh, about that is important. Yeah, I think it's who you're trying to to reach. If it's uh, strategic, then then no, it wouldn't be all of San Mateo out. If you're if you're, as was discussed, it's more eateries. Uh, if you're talking about trying to get the the hair uh, hair salons and other things, and that that's more broad based. And I know being on a conference call with uh, Redwood City, they had challenges because they were having hair cutting salons near restaurants, and that didn't mesh too well obviously so there there was logistic i know it sounds funny but when i was listening to the lady go well that makes sense but but she, and her job was to try to coordinate that in redwood city and she was giving us an update on the uh local uh economic recovery committee for the and so that's what she why she was one of, or one of the speakers so um if it's mainly for the eateries then it should be more strategic it should not just be the whole seven tail avenue um my opinion. Mr. Mayor? Yes. So I think, I think um, based on my research and, and um, w working with Karen Cunningham and compiling the data that most likely will be on the northern side, the staff could, could, could quickly, there's only a few restaurants on the southern side. Um, uh, one of them, Cleo's, is out of business, the Brazilian Steakhouse, or three, they're going through a remodel. Uh, Caballan uh, also closed down, shuttered up. Um, so I, there's probably not too many restaurants left on the south end that, um, and those that we talked to weren't too interested. Um, so it wouldn't take too much time to get that confirmed that they're still not interested and it wouldn't seem reasonable probably to shut down that whole block for two restaurants when there's another 20 businesses down that street. But um, I, I think that as we're going forward to, to, to have staff do what the city manager said and, and, and uh, maybe, um, and we're not ignoring, I'm not ignoring what I've heard from, from John uh, the, um, either from Burlingame that restaurants are struggling even more as, as, as we're right here right now, as their money's running out, as they're figuring out like maybe this is their last month if they can't figure it out. Um, and maybe we get off the watch list in a month, maybe, who knows? So um, doing the additional research, taking a pause, but with the plan to quickly get that data so we could justify doing what we're doing. That, that, so I'm in favor of that, of, of, of at least taking that step and see where we can get from there. If it means the parking lots that are nearby those restaurants, maybe maybe allowing them to take some of those spaces, right? And it's doing whatever we can, if the interest is there, if, some, if they're gonna bring their workers back and put tables out and do the labor and do all that, then I'm willing to meet them and, and extend my hand. But if there's no interest there, then it, there's no interest there. Yeah, and I did notice today one of the restaurants uh, took the side parking and put a nice awning on it, and so quite a bit of uh, open space. So uh, they're utilizing that parking. They did really good. Yeah, I'm impressed. If 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 staff is really busy, if if staff is busy, they're always busy. I get it. I I, I will offer to to be and walk the the, the neighborhood to assist staff, you wanna make a subcommittee, an ad hoc subcommittee 
I'm willing to serve on it. I'm not running for any any position this year, so it's not it's not political. Noted. So I think you'd be safe. I think you're so safe. So I volunteer to be that ad hoc person, and, and I'll assist staff. And I know a lot of the merchants already. So let's uh, get it done. Vice Mayor Salazar. I was I was just going to say I, I I agree with Marty, uh, and and I, I commend him for stepping up to to being the guy to go out and, and get some answers. Um, and maybe we, that can be coordinated with staff so that we uh, we get the data. But yeah, I mean, I don't want to create solutions and then try to find a problem to apply them to. So if there's no interest, then definitely. Yeah, I mean, I have no problem uh, allocating some taxpayer dollars to helping our businesses if, if there's an interest and people are willing to to uh, take advantage of it. But uh, being that, you know, the city manager is telling us that there hasn't been interest yet. Um, maybe that data is a little stale, so um, let's definitely get some new data. Let's find out if there's some interest in, in doing anything here and um, get that input because uh, no sense in doing it if no one's going to take advantage. So, uh, to the mayor, if I can. Please. So, um, uh, I hate to be the one to say this, but the city attorney has uh, informed me that appointing a subcommittee, be it one person or multiple people, is not on the agenda, so you can't do that. Uh, but, unofficially let me say this uh don't it was said so the staff is busy of course i mean we're dealing with a pandemic and all this other stuff but uh and you know people are still working from home hey you know council wants us to look into this we will do a robust outreach um and marty you know you you know we'll we'll we'll, we'll do the survey and you know we'll give you all the information call people up, <laughs> walk, walk San Mateo ad encourage it the business owners to fill it out and, and provide their feedback. Uh, and then we can, we, we, we will use that data to inform uh, uh, the information that, that goes back to you. And I think we can uh, hopefully do that in, in relatively short order uh, and get it back to you uh, in an off agenda memo. Uh, and if it's looking like there's significant robust interest, uh, we, can, we can put together a plan and even schedule a special meeting uh, if necessary to put together the full plan. I think what, what uh, council is saying is when you sort of look on a map, clearly there is a, um, a, uh, a, a, a cohort of restaurants between Canes and Angus. I think the question is, do you go uh, extend past Canes and Angus and go uh, from uh, Canes to uh, 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 Genevan would be, be, be too far. So then, um, and so the, clearly, uh, Kane to Angus is, I think, the stretch that everyone's talking about. And the question is, do you also go uh, Angus, uh, Angus to Sylvan? Uh, there are not a lot of restaurants um, um, on on that area. There are a few. Um, there's, yeah. So. Okay. So what what I'm hearing from council is. Uh, to make more strategic uh, where there are eateries. What I'm hearing is uh, Marty can certainly give you a list of uh, contacts and uh, or maybe uh, those of interest uh, and that's, that might assist staff. And uh, uh, is that, uh, <laughs> I was gonna, that's me walking downtown. I, I, I figured that one out. Um, is that good enough, Javon? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. I think we're going to uh, take a look at Kane saying this, um, given the, the number of restaurants there uh, versus uh, the other stretch. If that's okay with council or other direction, do you want to, do you want to have a, a larger area surveyed or a more tailored area? I, I'm fine with the area that you just talked about. Yeah. And I just want to say, I think that there might be um, a difference in semantics, but uh, there's an email that our city manager sent to us in June that talks about how other jurisdictions have uh, allowed <clears throat> outdoor dining prior to us um, and uh, separates the alfresco dining from outdoor from actual outdoor dining and so um, just for purposes of the record um, it's, it is clear that other other jurisdictions did allow for alfresco dining before us and there is and it goes into a separation with outdoor um, with closures versus outdoor dining so um, 
there maybe it would be worth it to go back to the chamber and ask who has been questioned in the past and then ask those same people within that those street closures that you that you just mentioned um, whether they might be interested now if they weren't before and to make sure that you're speaking with the owners of the location. Okay, um, <clears throat> there was a, another item, uh, Councilmember, in regards to the recognition for a uh, random act of kindness at San Bruno Avenue um, and San Mateo Avenue on August the 12th, 2020. Oh yeah, this was just a really great story. Um, a fellow lion, I'm not a lion, but I'll say a fellow lion, Marco Durazo, happened to see a woman jump out of her car and um, really just help this little old lady cross the street. Um, her name is Artie Singh, and she actually doesn't um, want praise. She just feels like she did something nice, um, and we messaged each other a couple of times, but she didn't want any praise, and from what I gather, because we spoke, and she said I was just doing something nice, um, and I was just really impressed watching the video. You see nobody honking, nobody is getting impatient, um, she didn't even flinch to get out of the car to help this woman she didn't know. And it just seems like at a time when everybody is so, um, you know, defensive over a number of things that, um, you know, tones are unnecessary. You've got this nice woman just jumping out of her car helping this stranger. So um, I think we need more of that. And it was really a beautiful video to see. And within a day of being shared, yeah, it had over like 25,000 views, um, and I just thought it was quite beautiful. So to Miss Singh, um, we really thank you, and it definitely brightened up my day to watch that. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Council Member Medina. Yeah, um, just a, uh, two comments, uh, announcement, and, and um, you know, that it is amazing how, how people sometimes just do the right thing because – it's they're good people, and I, I wanted to uh, share something that that happened with with my neighbor uh, Jay Morena and and uh, his girlfriend Amy Yi. They were they were driving up 280, and they saw a fire, and they saw a couple fires as as it was going on. And after talking to him, to him and more about it, they stopped their car, tried to with their case of. Costco water they were trying to put it out as, as best they could and um, you know it's funny or coincidentally this same guy is in charge of the um, second harvest uh, food bank uh, distribution that's going to happen on this Thursday um, from 2 45 to 4 15 p.m. Bel Air school if uh, that come out right mm -hmm. um, Call this number, 1-800-984-3663, and uh, you can sign up, and, and you can have food on Thursday, and we do it every month. A bunch of volunteers from uh, St. Robert's, Sister Cheryl, and her group with lines and rotary and uh, community members uh, um, with Les Le Leslie H H Hatania. Um, I always have a hard time saying that. Um, helping get these volunteers and, and it's great. So get your food, do good deeds, wear your mask, wash your hands, all that good stuff. Thank you. Anything uh, from you, uh, Mr. Salazar? No, just uh, can we adjourn? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, anything from you, Miss, Mrs. Davis? You're on mute. You're still on mute. Okay, um, I will just end and uh, uh, thank uh, Council Member Davis, who not only worked a full day, but also spent her birthday with us this evening. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't uh, have a cake, but we all couldn't get together. But uh, what's left of your birthday, uh, enjoy the, the, the last 30 minutes of it. But, uh, <laughs> happy, happy birthday. birthday. Uh, best wishes. And uh, with that said, we're going to adjourn, adjourn to the next regular city council meeting, which will be held on September <coughs> 2020 at 7 o'clock. Uh, everybody, best wishes. Uh, stay healthy. Stay strong. Good night.